Little Red Riding Hood From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Once upon a time there was a dear little girl who was loved by everyone who looked at her, but most of all by her grandmother, and there was nothing that she would not have given to the child. Once she gave her a little cap of red velvet, which suited her so well that she would never wear anything else. So she was always called Little Red Riding Hood. One day her mother said to her, Come, Little Red Riding Hood, here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine. Take them to your grandmother. She is ill and weak, and they will do her good. Set out before it gets hot, and when you are going, walk nicely and quietly, and do not run off the path, or you may fall and break the bottle, and then your grandmother will get nothing. And when you go into her room, don't forget to say, Good morning, and don't peep into every corner before you do it. I will take great care, said Little Red Riding Hood to her mother, and gave her hand on it. The grandmother lived out in the wood, half a league from the village, and just as Little Red Riding Hood entered the wood, a wolf met her. Little Red Riding Hood did not know what a wicked creature he was, and was not at all afraid of him. "'Good day, Little Red Riding Hood,' said he. "'Thank you kindly, Wolf. Whether away so early, Little Red Riding Hood?' "'To my grandmother's. What have you got in your apron?' A "'Cake and wine. Yesterday was baking day, so poor sick grandmother is to have something good to make her stronger. Where does your grandmother live, Little Red Riding Hood? A good quarter of a league farther on in the wood. Her house stands under three large oak trees. The nut trees are just below. You surely must know it, replied Little Red Riding Hood. The wolf thought to himself, What a tender young creature! What a nice plump mouthful! <laughs> she will be better to eat than the old woman. I must act craftily, so as to catch both. So he walked for a short time by the side of Little Red Riding Hood, and then he said, See, Little Red Riding Hood, how pretty the flowers are about here. Why do you not look around? I believe, too, that you do not hear how sweetly the little birds are singing. You walk gravely along as if you were going to school, while everything else out here in the world is merry. Little Red Riding Hood raised her eyes, and when she saw the sunbeams dancing here and there through the trees, and pretty flowers growing everywhere, she thought, oh, Suppose I take Grandmother a fresh nosegay. That would please her, too. It is so early in the day that I shall still get there in good time. And so she ran from the path into the wood to look for flowers. And whenever she had picked one, she fancied that she saw a still prettier one farther on, and ran after it, and so got deeper and deeper into the wood. Meanwhile the wolf ran straight to the grandmother's house and knocked at the door. Who is there? Little Red Riding Hood replied the wolf. She is bringing cake and wine. Open the door. Uh, lift the latch, cried out the grandmother. I am too weak and cannot get up. The wolf lifted the latch, the door sprang open, and without saying a word he went straight to the grandmother's bed and devoured her. Then he put on her clothes, dressed himself in her cap, laid himself in bed, and drew the curtains. Little Red Riding Hood, however, had been running about picking flowers, and when she had gathered so many that she could carry no more, she remembered her grandmother, and set out on the way to her. She was surprised to find the cottage door standing open, and when she went into the room she had a, such a strange feeling that she said to herself, "'Oh, dear, how uneasy I feel to-day! And at other times I like being with grandmother so much!' She called out, "'Good morning!' but received no answer. So she went to the bed and drew back the curtains. There lay her grandmother with her cap pulled far over her face, and looking very strange. 
"'Oh, grandmother,' she said, "'what big ears you have!' "'The better to hear you with, my child,' was the reply. "'But, grandmother, what big eyes you have!' she said. "'The better to see you with, my dear. "'But, grandmother, what large hands you have! "'The better to hug you with. "'Oh, but, grandmother, what a terrible big mouth you have! "'The better to eat you with!' "'And scarcely had the wolf said this "'than with one bound he was out of bed "'and swallowed up little Red Riding Hood.' When the wolf had appeased his appetite, he lay down again in the bed, fell asleep, and began to snore very loud. The huntsman was just passing the house, and thought to himself, "'How the old woman is snoring! I must just see if she wants anything.' So he went into the room, and when he came to the bed, he saw that the wolf was lying in it. "'Do I find you here, you old sinner?' said he, I have long sought you. Then, just as he was going to fire at him, it occurred to him that the wolf might have devoured the grandmother, and that she might still be saved. So he did not fire, but took a pair of scissors, and began to cut open the stomach of the sleeping wolf. When he had made two snips, he saw the little red riding hood shining, and then he made two snips more, and the little girl sprang out, crying, Ah, how frightened I have been! How dark it was inside the wolf's! And after that the aged grandmother came out alive also, but scarcely able to breathe. Little Red Riding Hood, however, quickly fetched great stones with which to fill the wolf's belly, and when he awoke he wanted to run away, but the stones were so heavy that he collapsed at once and fell dead. Then all three were delighted. The huntsman drew off the wolf's skin and went home with it. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine which Little Red Riding Hood had brought, and revived. But Little Red Riding Hood thought to herself, "'As long as I live, I will never by myself leave the path to run into the wood when my mother has forbidden me to do so.' It was also related that once, when Little Red Riding Hood was again taking cakes to the old grandmother, Another wolf spoke to her, and tried to entice her from the path. Little Red Riding Hood, however, was on her guard, and went straight forward on her way, and told her grandmother that she had met the wolf, and that he had said good morning to her, but with such a wicked look in his eyes, that if they had not been on the public road she was certain he would have eaten her up. "'Well,' said the grandmother, we will shut the door, that he may not come in. Soon afterwards the wolf knocked, and cried, Open the door, grandmother. I am Little Red Riding Hood, and am bringing you some cakes. But they did not speak, or open the door. So the greybeard stole twice or thrice around the house, and at last jumped on the roof, intending to wait until Little Riding Hood went home in the evening, and then to steal after her, and devour her in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what was in his thoughts. In front of the house was a great stone trough. So she said to the child, Take the pail, little Red Riding Hood. I made some sausages yesterday, so carry the water in which I boiled them to the trough. Little Red Riding Hood carried until the great trough was quite full. Then the smell of the sausages reached the wolf, and he sniffed and peeped down, and at last stretched out his neck so far that he could no longer keep his footing and began to slip, and slipped down from the roof straight into the great trough and was drowned. But Little Red Riding Hood went joyously home, and no one ever did anything to harm her again. End of Little Red Riding Hood The Robber Bridegroom from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. There once was a miller who had one beautiful daughter, and as she was grown up, he was anxious that she should be well married and provided for. 
he said to himself, "'I will give her to the first suitable man who comes and asks for her hand.' Not long after a suitor appeared, and as he appeared to be very rich, and the miller could see nothing in him with which to find fault, he betrothed his daughter to him. But the girl did not care for the man as a girl ought to care for her betrothed husband, and she could not look at him, nor think of him, without an inward shudder. One day he said to her, "'You have not paid me a visit, although we have been betrothed for some time.' "'I do not know where your house is,' she answered. "'My house is out there in the dark forest,' he said. She tried to excuse herself by saying that she would not be able to find the way thither. Her betrothed only replied, "'You must come and see me next Sunday. I have already invited guests for that day, and that you might not mistake the way, I will strew ashes along the path.' When Sunday came, and it was time for the girl to start, a feeling of dread came over her which she could not explain, and that she might not be able to find her path again, she filled her pockets with peas and lentils to sprinkle on the ground as she went along. On reaching the entrance to the forest, she found the path strewed with ashes, and these she followed, throwing down some peas on either side of her at every step she took. She walked the whole day until she came to the deepest, darkest part of the forest. There she saw a lonely house, looking so grim and mysterious that it did not please her at all. She stepped inside, but not a soul was to be seen, and a great silence reigned throughout. Suddenly a voice cried, "'Turn back! Turn back, young maiden fair! Linger not in this murderer's lair!' The girl looked up and saw that the voice came from a bird hanging in a cage on the wall. Again it cried, "'Turn back! Turn back, young maiden fair! Linger not in this murderer's lair!' The girl passed on, going from room to room of the house, but they were all empty, and still she saw no one. At last she came to the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman, who could not keep her head from shaking. "'Can you tell me,' asked the girl, "'if my betrothed husband lives here?' "'Ah, you poor child!' answered the old woman. What a place for you to come to! This is a murderer's den. You think yourself a promised bride, and that your marriage will soon take place, but it is with death that you will keep your marriage feast. Look, do you see that large cauldron of water which I am obliged to keep on the fire? As soon as they have you in their power, they will kill you without mercy, and cook and eat you, for they are eaters of men. If I did not take pity on you and save you, you would be lost." Thereupon the old woman led her behind a large cask, which quite hid her from view. "'Keep as still as a mouse,' she said. "'Do not move or speak or it will be all over with you. Tonight, when the robbers are all asleep, we will flee together. I have long been waiting for an opportunity to escape." The words were hardly out of her mouth when the godless crew returned, dragging another girl along with them. They were all drunk and paid no heed to her cries and lamentations. They gave her wine to drink, three glasses full one of white wine, one of red, and one of yellow, and with that her heart gave way and she died. Then they tore off her dainty clothing, laid her on a table, and cut her beautiful body into pieces, and sprinkled salt upon it. The poor betrothed girl crouched trembling and shuddering behind the cask, for she saw what a terrible fate had been intended for her by the robbers. One of them now noticed a gold ring still remaining on the little finger of the murdered girl, and as he could not draw it off easily, he took a hatchet and cut off the finger. But the finger sprang into the air, and fell behind the cask into the lap of the girl who was hiding there. The robber took a light and began looking for it, but he could not find it. "'Have you looked behind the large cask?' said one of the others. But the old woman called out, Come and eat your suppers, 
and let the thing be till to-morrow. The finger won't run away.' "'Ah, the old woman is right,' said the robbers, and they ceased looking for the finger and sat down. The old woman then mixed a sleeping draught with their wine, and before long they were all lying on the floor of the cellar, fast asleep and snoring. As soon as the girl was assured of this, she came from behind the cask. She was obliged to step over the bodies of the sleepers, who were lying close together, and every moment she was filled with renewed dread, lest she should awaken them. But God helped her, so that she passed safely over them. And then she and the old woman went upstairs, opened the door, and hastened as fast as they could from the murderer's den. They found the ashes scattered by the wind, but the peas and lentils had sprouted, had grown sufficiently above the ground to guide them in the moonlight along the path. All night long they walked, and it was morning before they reached the mill. Then the girl told her father all that had happened. The day came that had been fixed for the marriage. The bridegroom arrived, and also a large company of guests, for the miller had taken care to invite all his friends and relations. As they sat at the feast, each guest in turn was asked to tell a tale. The bride sat still, and did not say a word. "'And you, my love,' said the bridegroom, turning to her, "'is there no tale you know? Tell us something.' "'I will tell you a dream, then,' said the bride. "'I went alone through a forest, and came at last to a house. Not a soul could I find within. But a bird that was hanging in a cage on the wall cried, "'Turn back, turn back, young maiden fair, linger not in this murderer's lair.' And again a second time it said these words, "'My darling, this is only a dream.' I went on through the house from room to room, but they were all empty, and everything was so grim and mysterious. At last I went down to the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman, who could not keep her head still. I asked her if my betrothed lived there, and she answered, "'Oh, you poor child, you are come to a murderer's den. Your betrothed does indeed live here, but he will kill you without mercy, and afterwards cook and eat you. My darling, this is only a dream. The old woman hid me behind a large cask, and scarcely had she done this when the robbers returned home, dragging a young girl along with them. They gave her three kinds of wine to drink, white, red, and yellow, and with that she died. My darling, this is only a dream. Then they tore off her dainty clothing, and cut her beautiful body into pieces, and sprinkled salt upon it. My darling, this is only a dream. And one of the robbers saw that there was a gold ring still left on her finger, and as it was difficult to draw off, he took a hatchet and cut off her finger. But the finger sprang into the air, and fell behind the great cask into my lap. And here! is the finger with the ring. And with these words the bride drew forth the finger, and showed it to the assembled guests. The bridegroom, who during this recital had grown deadly pale, up and tried to escape, but the guests seized him, and held him fast. They delivered him up to justice, and he and all his murderous band were condemned to death for their wicked deeds. End of the Robber Bridegroom Tom Thumb from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm A poor woodman sat in his cottage one night, smoking his pipe by the fireside, while his wife sat by his side, spinning. "'How lonely it is, wife,' said he, as he puffed out a long curl of smoke, for you and me to sit here by ourselves, without any children to play about and amuse us, while other people seem so happy and merry with their children. "'What you say is very true,' said the wife, sighing and turning round her wheel. "'How happy should I be if I had but one child! If it were ever so small, yea, if it were no bigger than my thumb, I should be very happy and love it dearly. Now.' 
odd as you may think it, it came to pass that this good woman's wish was fulfilled just in the very way she had wished it, for not long afterwards she had a little boy, who was quite healthy and strong, but was not much bigger than my thumb. So they said, Well, we cannot say we have not got what we wished for, and little as he is, we will love him dearly. And they called him Thomas Thumb. They gave him plenty of food, yet for all they could do he never grew bigger, but kept just the same size as he had been when he was born. Still his eyes were sharp and sparkling, and he soon showed himself to be a clever little fellow who always knew well what he was about. One day, as the woodman was getting ready to go into the wood to cut fuel, he said, I wish I had someone to bring the cart after me, for I want to make haste. Oh, father, cried Tom, I will take care of that. The cart shall be in the wood by the time you want it. Then the woodman laughed and said, oh, How can that be? You cannot reach up to the horse's bridle. Never mind that, father, said Tom. If my mother will only harness the horse, I will get into his ear and tell him which way to go. Well, said the father, we will try for once. When the time came, the mother harnessed the horse to the carts and put Tom into his ear. And as he sat there, the little man told the beast how to go, crying out, Go on! and stop! as he wanted. And thus the horse went on just as well as if the woodman had driven it himself into the wood. It happened that as the horse was going a little too fast, and Tom was calling out, Gently! Gently! Two strangers came up. What an odd thing that is, said one. There is a cart going along, and I hear a carter talking to the horse, but yet I can see no one. That is queer indeed said the other. Let us follow the cart and see where it goes. So they went on into the wood, till at last they came to the place where the woodman was. Then Tom Thumb, seeing his father, cried out, See, father, here I am with the cart, all right and safe. Now take me down. So his father took hold of the horse with one hand, and with the other took his son out of the horse's ear, and put him down upon a straw where he sat as merry as you please. The two strangers were all this time looking on, and did not know what to say for wonder. At last one took the other aside and said, That little urchin will make our fortune, if we can get him and carry him about from town to town as a show. We must buy him. So they went up to the woodman and asked him what he would take for the little man. He will be better off, said they, with us than with you. I won't sell him at all, said the father. My own flesh and blood is dearer to me than all the silver and gold in the world. But Tom, hearing of the bargain they wanted to make, crept up his father's coat to his shoulder and whispered in his ear, Take the money, father, and let them have me. I'll soon come back to you. So the woodman at last said he would sell Tom to the strangers for a large piece of gold, and they paid the price. "'Where would you like to sit?' said one of them. "'Oh, put me on the rim of your hat. That will be a nice gallery for me. I can walk about there and see the country as we go along.' So they did as he wished, and when Tom had taken leave of his father, they took him away with them. They journeyed on till it began to be dusky, and then the little man said, Let me get down. I'm tired. So the man took off his hat and put him down on a clod of earth in a ploughed field by the side of the road. But Tom ran about amongst the furrows, and at last slipped into an old mouse hole. Good night, my masters, said he. I'm off. Mind and look sharp after me the next time. Then they ran at once to the place and poked the ends of their sticks into the mouse hole, but all in vain. Tom only crawled farther and farther in, and at last it became quite dark, so that they were forced to go their way without their prize, 
as sulky as could be. When Tom found they were gone, he came out of his hiding-place. "'What dangerous walking it is,' said he, "'in this ploughed field. If I were to fall from one of these great clods, I should undoubtedly break my neck.' At last, by good luck, he found a large, empty snail-shell. "'This is lucky,' said he. "'I can sleep here very well.' And in he crept. Just as he was falling asleep, he heard two men passing by, chatting together, and one said to the other, "'How can we rob that rich parson's house of his silver and gold?' "'I'll tell you,' cried Tom. "'What noise was that?' said the thief, frightened. "'I'm sure I heard some one speak.' They stood listening, and Tom said, "'Take me with you, and I'll soon show you how to get the parson's money. But uh, where are you?' said they. "'Look about on the ground,' answered he, "'and listen where the sound comes from.' At last the thieves found him out, and lifted him up in their hands. "'You little urchin,' they said, "'what can you do for us?' "'Why, I can get between the iron window-bars of the parson's house, and throw you out whatever you want.' Mm, "'That's a good thought,' said the thieves. "'Come along. We shall see what you can do.' When they came to the parson's house, Tom slipped through the window-bars into the room and then called out as loud as he could bawl, "'Will you have all that is here?' At this the thieves were frightened, and said, "'Softly, softly, speak low, that you may not awaken anybody.' But Tom seemed as if he did not understand them, and bawled out again, "'How much will you have? Shall I throw it all out?' Now the cook lay in the next room and hearing a noise, she raised herself up in her bed and listened. Meantime the thieves were frightened, and ran off a little way. But at last they plucked up their hearts, and said, "'This little urchin is only trying to make fools of us.' So they came back, and whispered softly to him, saying, "'Now let us have no more of your roguish jokes, but throw us out some of the money.' Then Tom called out as loud as he could, "'Very well. Hold your hands. Here it comes.' The cook heard this quite plain, so she sprang out of her bed and ran to the open door. The thieves ran off as if a wolf was at their tails, and the maid, having groped about and found nothing, went away for a light. By the time she came back Tom had slipped off into the barn, and when she looked about, and searched every hole and corner, and found nobody, she went to bed, thinking she must have been dreaming with her eyes open. The little man crawled about in the hayloft, and at last found a snug place to finish his night's rest in. So he laid himself down, meaning to sleep till daylight, and then find his way home to his father and mother. But, alas! how woefully he was undone! What crosses and sorrows happen to us all in this world! The cook got up early, before daybreak, to feed the cows, and going straight to the hayloft, carried away a large bundle of hay, with the little man in the middle of it, fast asleep. He still, however, slept on, and did not awake till he found himself in the mouth of a cow, for the cook had put the hay into the cow's rick, and the cow had taken Tom up in a mouthful of it. "'Good lack a day,' said he. "'How came I to tumble into the mill?' But he soon found out where he really was, and was forced to have all his wits about him, that he might not get between the cow's teeth, and so be crushed to death. At last down he went into her stomach. "'It is rather dark,' said he. "'They forgot to build windows in this room to let the sun in. A candle would be no bad thing.' Though he made the best of his bad luck, he did not like his quarters at all, and the worst of it was that more and more hay was always coming down, 
and the space left for him became smaller and smaller. At last he cried out as loud as he could, "'Don't bring me any more hay!' The maid happened to be just then milking the cow, and hearing someone speak, but seeing nobody, and yet being quite sure it was the same voice that she had heard in the night, she was so frightened that she fell off her stool and overset the milk-pail. As soon as she could pick herself up out of the dirt, she ran off as fast as she could to her master, the parson, and said, "'Sir, sir, the cow is talking!' But the parson said, "'Woman, thou art surely mad!' However, he went with her into the cow-house to try and see what was the matter. Scarcely had he set foot on the threshold when Tom called out, "'Don't bring me any more hay!' Then the parson himself was frightened, and thinking the cow was surely bewitched, told his man to kill her on the spot. So the cow was killed and cut up, and the stomach in which Tom lay was thrown out upon a dunghill. Tom soon set himself to work to get out, which was not a very easy task, but at last, just as he had made room to get his head out, fresh ill luck befell him. A hungry wolf sprang out, and swallowed up the whole stomach with Tom in it at one gulp, and ran away. Tom, however, was still not disheartened, and thinking the wolf would not dislike having some chat with him as he was going along, he called out, "'My good friend, I can show you a famous treat.' "'Where's that?' said the wolf. "'In such and such a house.' said Tom, describing his own father's house. "'You can crawl through the drain into the kitchen, and then into the pantry, and there you will find cakes, ham, beef, cold chicken, roast pig, apple dumplings, and everything that your heart can wish.' The wolf did not want to be asked twice, so that very night he went to the house and crawled through the drain into the kitchen, and then into the pantry, and ate and drank there to his heart's content. As soon as he had had enough, he wanted to get away, but he had eaten so much that he could not get out by the same way he came in. This was just what Tom had reckoned upon, but now he began to set up a great shout, making all the noise he could. "'Will you be easy?' said the wolf. "'You'll awaken everybody in the house if you make such a clatter.' "'What's that to me?' said the little man. "'You have had your frolic. Now I've a mind to be merry myself.' And he began singing and shouting as loud as he could. The woodman and his wife, being awakened by the noise, peeped through a crack in the door. But when they saw a wolf was there, you may well suppose that they were sadly frightened, and the woodman ran for his axe and gave his wife a scythe. "'Do you stay behind,' said the woodman, "'and when I have knocked him on the head, "'you must rip him up with the scythe.' "'Tom heard all this, and cried out, "'Father, father, I am here! "'The wolf has swallowed me!' "'And his father said, "'Heaven be praised! "'We have found our dear child again!' "'And he told his wife not to use the scythe, "'for fear she should hurt him. Then he aimed a great blow, and struck the wolf on the head, and killed him on the spot. And when he was dead they cut open his body, and set Tommy free. Ah! said the father, what fears we have had for you! Yes, father, answered he, I have travelled all over the world, I think, in one way or other, since we parted and now I am very glad to come home and get fresh air again. Why, where have you been? said his father. I have been in a mouse hole, in a snail shell, and down a cow's throat, and in a wolf's belly, and yet here I am again, safe and sound. Well, said they, you are come back and we will not sell you again for all the riches in the world. Then they hugged and kissed their dear little son, and gave him plenty to eat and drink, for he was very hungry, and then they fetched new clothes for him, for his old clothes had been quite spoiled on his journey. 
So Master Thumb stayed at home with his father and mother in peace, for though he had been so great a traveller, and had done and seen so many fine things, and was fond enough of telling the whole story, he always agreed that, after all, there's no place like home. End of Tom Thumb Rumpelstiltskin From Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm By the side of a wood, in a country a long way off, ran a fine stream of water, and upon the stream there stood a mill. The miller's house was close by, and the miller, you must know, had a very beautiful daughter. She was, moreover, very shrewd and clever, and the miller was so proud of her that he one day told the king of the land, who used to come and hunt in the wood, that his daughter could spin gold out of straw. Now this king was very fond of money, and when he heard the miller's boast, his greediness was raised, and he sent for the girl to be brought before him. Then he led her to a chamber in his palace, where there was a great heap of straw, and gave her a spinning-wheel, and said, all this must be spun into gold before morning, as you love your life. It was in vain that the poor maiden said that it was only a silly boast of her father, for that she could do no such thing as spin straw into gold. The chamber door was locked, and she was left alone. She sat down in one corner of the room and began to bewail her hard fate. But suddenly the door opened and a droll-looking little man hobbled in, and said, "'Good morrow to you, my good lass. What are you weeping for?' "'Alas,' said she, "'I must spin this straw into gold, and I know not how.' Ah, "'What will you give me,' said the hobgoblin, "'to do it for you?' "'My necklace,' replied the maiden. He took her at her word and sat himself down to the wheel, and whistled and sang, Round about, round about, lo, and behold, Reel away, reel away, straw into gold. And round about the wheel went merrily. The work was quickly done, and the straw was all spun into gold. When the king came and saw this, he was greatly astonished and pleased. But his heart grew still more greedy of gain, and he shut up the poor miller's daughter again with a fresh task. Then she knew not what to do, and sat down once more to weep. But the dwarf soon opened the door and said, "'What will you give me to do your task?' "'The ring on my finger,' said she. So her little friend took the ring, and began to work at the wheel again, and whistled and sang, Round about, round about, lo, and behold, Reel away, reel away, straw into gold. Till long before morning all was done again. King was greatly delighted to see all this glittering treasure, but still he had not enough. So he took the miller's daughter to a yet larger heap, and said, All this must be spun to-night, and if it is, you shall be my queen. As soon as she was alone, that dwarf came in, and said, What will you give me to spin gold for you this third time? I have nothing left, said she. Then say you will give me, said the little man, the first little child that you may have when you are queen. That may never be, thought the miller's daughter, and as she knew no other way to get her task done, she said she would do what he asked. Round went the wheel again to the old song, and the mannikin once more spun the heap into gold. The king came in the morning, and finding all he wanted, was forced to keep his word. So he married the miller's daughter, 
and she really became queen. At the birth of her first child she was very glad, and forgot the dwarf and what she had said. But one day he came into her room, where she was sitting playing with her baby, and put her in mind of it. Then she grieved sorely at her misfortune, and said she would give him all the wealth of the kingdom if he would let her off, but in vain, till at last her tears softened him, and he said, I will give you three days' grace, and if during that time you tell me my name, you shall keep your child. Now the queen lay awake all night, thinking of all the odd names that she had ever heard, and she sent messengers all over the land to find out new ones. The next day the little man came, and she began with Timothy, Ichabod, Benjamin, Jeremiah, and all the names she could remember. But to all and each of them he said, Madam, that's not my name. The second day she began with all the comical names she had heard of, bandy-legs, hunchback, crookshanks, and so on. But the little gentleman still said to every one of them, Madam, that is not my name. The third day one of the messengers came back and said, I have travelled two days without hearing of any other names, but yesterday, as I was climbing a high hill, among the trees of the forest where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, I saw a little hut, and before the hut burnt a fire, and round about the fire a funny little dwarf was dancing upon one leg and singing. Merrily the feast I'll make, today I'll brew, to-morrow bake, merrily I'll dance and sing, for next day will a stranger bring, little does my lady dream, Rumpelstiltskin is my name. When the king heard this, she jumped for joy, and as soon as her little friend came, she sat down upon her throne, and called all her court round to enjoy the fun. And the nurse stood by her side with the baby in her arms, as if it was quite ready to be given up. Then the little man began to chuckle at the thought of having the poor child to take home with him to his hut in the woods, and he cried out, Now, lady, what is my name? Is it John? asked she. No, madam. Is it Tom? No, madam. Is it Jemmy? It is not. Can your name be Rumpelstiltskin? said the lady, slyly. Some witch told you that! Some witch told you that! cried the little man, and dashed his right foot in a rage so deep into the floor that he was forced to lay hold of it with both hands to pull it out. Then he made the best of his way off, while the nurse laughed and the baby crowed, and all the court jeered at him for having had so much trouble for nothing, and said, We wish you a very good morning and a merry feast, Mr. Rumpelstiltskin. End of Rumpelstiltskin Clever Gretel from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There once was a cook named Gretel, who wore shoes with red heels, and when she walked out with them on, she turned herself this way and that, was quite happy, and thought, You certainly are a pretty girl. And when she came home she drank, in her gladness of heart, a draught of wine and as wine excites a desire to eat, she tasted the best of whatever she was cooking until she was satisfied, and said, The cook must know what the food is like. It came to pass that the master one day said to her, Gretel, there is a guest coming this evening. Prepare me two fowls very daintily. I will see to it, master, answered Gretel. She killed two fowls, scalded them, plucked them, put them on a spit, and towards evening set them before the fire, that they might roast. The fowls began to turn brown, and were nearly ready, but the guest had not yet arrived. Then Gretel called out to her master, If the guest does not come, 
I must take the fowls away from the fire, but it will be a sin and a shame if they are not eaten the moment they are at their juiciest. The master said, I will run myself and fetch the guest. When the master had turned his back, Gretel laid the spit with the fowls on one side, and thought, Standing so long by the fire there makes one sweat and thirsty. Who knows when they will come? Meanwhile, I will run into the cellar and take a drink. She ran down, set a drug, and said, God bless it for you, Gretel, and took a good drink, and thought that wine should flow on and should not be interrupted, and took yet another hearty draught. Then she went and put the fowls down again to the fire, basted them, and drove the spit merrily round. But as the roast meat smelt so good, Gretel thought, something might be wrong, it ought to be tasted. She touched it with her finger, and said, Ah, how good fowls are! It certainly is a sin and a shame that they are not eaten at the right time. She ran to the window to see if the master was not coming with his guest, but she saw no one, and went back to the fowls, and thought, one of the wings is burning. I had better take it off and eat it. So she cut it off, ate it, and enjoyed it, and when she had done, she thought, the other must go down too, or else master will observe that something is missing. When the two wings were eaten, she went and looked for her master, and did not see him. It suddenly occurred to her, who knows, they are perhaps not coming at all, and have turned in somewhere. Then she said, Well, Gretel, enjoy yourself. One fowl has been cut into. Take another drink, and eat it up entirely. When it is eaten, you will have some peace. Why should God's good gifts be spoiled? So she ran into the cellar again, took an enormous drink, and ate up the one chicken in great glee. When one of the chickens was swallowed down, and still her master did not come, Gretel looked at the other, and said, What one is, the other should be likewise. The two go together. What's right for the one is right for the other. I think if I were to take another draught, it would do me no harm. So she took another hearty drink, and let the second chicken follow the first. While she was making the most of it, the master came and cried, Hurry up, Gretel, the guest is coming directly after me. Yes, sir, I will soon serve up, answered Gretel. Meantime the master looked to see that the table was properly laid, and took the great knife wherewith he was going to carve the chickens, and sharpened it on the steps. Presently the guest came, and knocked politely and courteously at the house door. Gretel ran and looked to see who was there, and when she saw the guest, she put her finger to her lips, and said, Hush, hush, go away as quickly as you can. If my master catches you, it will be the worse for you. He certainly did ask you to supper, but his intention is to cut off your two ears. Just listen how he is sharpening the knife for it. The guest heard the sharpening, and hurried down the steps again as fast as he could. Gretel was not idle. She ran screaming to her master, and cried, You have invited a fine guest. Why, Gretel, what do you mean by that? Yes, said she, he has taken the chickens which I was just going to serve up off the dish, and has run away with them. Well, that's a nice trick, said her master and lamented the fine chickens. If he had but left me one, so that something remained for me to eat. He called to him to stop, but the guest pretended not to hear. Then he ran after him, with the knife still in his hand, crying, Just one, just one, meaning that the guest should leave him just one chicken and not take both. The guest, however, thought no otherwise than that he was to give up one of his ears, and ran as if fire were burning under him, in order to take them both with him. End of Clever Gretel
The Old Man and His Grandson From Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There was once a very old man, whose eyes had become dim, his ears dull of hearing, his knees trembled, and when he sat at table he could hardly hold a spoon, and split the broth upon the tablecloth, or let it run out of his mouth. His son and his son's wife were disgusted at this, so the old grandfather at last had to sit in the corner behind the stove, and they gave him his food in an earthenware bowl, and not even enough of it. And he used to look towards the table with his eyes full of tears. Once, too, his trembling hands could not hold the bowl, and it fell to the ground and broke. The young wife scolded him, but he said nothing, and only sighed. Then they brought him a wooden bowl for a few haypens, out of which he had to eat. They were once sitting thus when the little grandson of four years old began to gather together some bits of wood upon the ground. "'What are you doing there?' asked the father. "'I am making a little trough,' answered the child, "'for father and mother to eat out of when I am big.' The man and his wife looked at each other for a while, and presently began to cry. Then they took the old grandfather to the table, and henceforth always let him eat with them, and likewise said nothing if he did spill a little of anything. End of the Old Man and His Grandson The Little Peasant from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. There was a certain village wherein no one lived but really rich peasants, and just one poor one, whom they called the little peasant. He had not even so much as a cow, and still less money to buy one, and yet he and his wife did so wish to have one. One day he said to her, Listen, I have a good idea. There is our gossip the carpenter. He shall make us a wooden calf and paint it brown, so that it looks like any other, and in time it will certainly get big and be a cow. The woman also liked the idea, and their gossip the carpenter cut and planed the calf and painted it as it ought to be, and made it with its head hanging down, as if it were eating. Next morning, when the cows were being driven out, the little peasant called the cowherd in and said, Look, I have a little calf here, but it is still small and has to be carried. The cowherd said, All right, and took it in his arms and carried it to the pasture and set it among the grass. The little calf always remained standing like one which was eating, and the cowherd said, It will soon run by itself. Just look how it eats already. At night, when he was going to drive the herd home again, he said to the calf, If you can stand there and eat your fill, you can also go on your four legs. I don't care to drag you home again in my arms. But the little peasant stood at his door and waited for his little calf, and when the cowherd drove the cows through the village and the calf was missing, he inquired where it was. The cowherd answered, It is still standing out there eating. It would not stop and come with us. But the little peasant said, Oh, but I must have my beast back again. Then they went back to the meadow together. But someone had stolen the calf, and it was gone. The cowherd said, It must have run away. The peasant, however, said, Don't tell me that, and led the cowherd before the mayor, who, for his carelessness, condemned him to give the peasant a cow for the calf which had run away. And now the little peasant and his wife had the cow for which they had so long wished, and they were heartily glad, but they had no food for it, and could give it nothing to eat, so it soon had to be killed. They salted the flesh, and the peasant went into the town and wanted to sell the skin there, so that he might buy a new calf with the proceeds. On the way he passed by a mill, and there sat a raven with broken wings, and out of pity he took him and wrapped him in the skin. 
but as the weather grew so bad, and there was a storm of rain and wind, he could go no farther, and turned back to the mill and begged for shelter. The miller's wife was alone in the house, and said to the peasant, Lay yourself on the straw there, and gave him a slice of bread and cheese. The peasant ate it, and lay down with his skin beside him, and the woman thought, He is tired and has gone asleep. In the meantime came the parson. The miller's wife received him well, and said, My husband is out, so we will have a feast. The peasant listened, and when he heard them talk about feasting, he was vexed that he had been forced to make shift with a slice of bread and cheese. Then the woman served up four different things, roast meat, salad, cakes, and wine. Just as they were about to sit down and eat, there was a knocking outside. The woman said, Oh, heavens, it is my husband. She quickly hid the roast meat inside the tile stove, the wine under the pillow, the salad on the bed, the cakes under it, and the parson in the closet on the porch. Then she opened the door for her husband, and said, Thank heaven you are back again. There is such a storm, it looks as if the world were coming to an end. The miller saw the peasant lying on the straw, and asked, What is that fellow doing there? Ah, said the wife, the poor knave came in the storm and rained and begged for shelter, so I gave him a bit of bread and cheese, and showed him where the straw was. The man said, I have no objection, but be quick and get me something to eat. The woman said, But I have nothing but bread and cheese. I am contented with anything, replied the husband. So far as I am concerned, bread and cheese will do. And looked at the peasant, and said, Come and eat some more with me. The peasant did not require to be invited twice, but got up and ate. After this the miller saw the skin in which the raven was lying on the ground, and asked, What have you there? The peasant answered, I have a soothsayer inside it. Mm, can he foretell anything to me? said the miller. Oh, why not? answered the peasant. But he only says four things, and the fifth he keeps to himself. The miller was curious, and said, Let him foretell something for once. Then the peasant pinched the raven's head, so that it croaked and made a noise like, Kaaaaa! Kaaaaa! The miller said, What did he say? The peasant answered, In the first place, he says that there is some wine hidden under the pillow. Bless me! cried the miller, and went there and found the wine. Now oh, go on, said he. The peasant made the raven croak again, and said, in the second place, he says that there is some roast meat in the tile stove. Upon my word, cried the miller, and went thither and found the roast meat. The peasant made the raven prophesy still more, and said, Thirdly, he says that there is some salad on the bed. That would be a fine thing, cried the miller, and went there and found the salad. At last the peasant pinched the raven once more till he croaked, and said, Fourthly, he says that there are some cakes under the bed. That would be a fine thing, cried the miller, and looked there and found the cakes. And now the two sat down to the table together, but the miller's wife was frightened to death, and went to bed and took all the keys with her. The miller would have liked much to know the fifth, but the little peasant said, First we will quickly eat the four things, for the fifth is something bad. So they ate, and after that they bargained how much the miller was to give for the fifth prophecy, until they agreed on three hundred dollars. Then the peasant once more pinched the raven's head till he croaked loudly. The miller asked, what did he say? The peasant replied, He says that the devil is hiding outside there in the closet on the porch. The miller said, The devil must go out, and opened the house door. 
Then the woman was forced to give up the keys, and the peasant unlocked the closet. The parson ran out as fast as he could, and the miller said, It was true. I saw the black rascal with my own eyes. The peasant, however, made off next morning by daybreak with the three hundred thalers. At home the small peasant gradually launched out. He built a beautiful house, and the peasant said, The small peasant has certainly been to the place where golden snow falls, and people carry the gold home in shovels. Then the small peasant was brought before the mayor, and bidden to say from whence his wealth came. He answered, I sold my cow's skin in the town for three hundred dollars. When the peasants heard that, they too wished to enjoy this great profit, and ran home, killed all their cows, and stripped off their skins in order to sell them in the town to the greatest advantage. The mayor, however, said, But my servant must go first. When she came to the merchant in the town, he did not give her more than two thalers for a skin, and when the others came, he did not give them so much, and said, What can I do with all these skins? Then the peasants were vexed that the small peasant should have thus outwitted them, wanted to take vengeance on him, and accused him of this treachery before the mayor. The innocent little peasant was unanimously sentenced to death, and was to be rolled into the water in a barrel pierced full of holes. He was led forth, and a priest was brought who was to say a mass for his soul. The others were all obliged to retire to a distance, and when the peasant looked at the priest, he recognized the man who had been with the miller's wife. He said to him, I set you free from the closet, set me free from the barrel. At this same moment up came, with a flock of sheep, the very shepherd whom the peasant knew had long been wishing to be mayor. So he cried with all his might, No, I will not do it. If the whole world insists on it, I will not do it. The shepherd, hearing that, came up to him and asked, What are you about? What is it that you will not do? The peasant said, they want to make me mayor if I will but put myself in the barrel, but I will not do it. The shepherd said, If nothing more than that is needful in order to be mayor, I would get into the barrel at once. The peasant said, If you will get in, you will be mayor. The shepherd was willing and got in, and the peasant shut the top down on him. Then he took the shepherd's flock for himself and drove it away. The parson went to the crowd and declared that the mass had been said. Then they came and rolled the barrel towards the water. When the barrel began to roll, the shepherd cried, I am quite willing to be mayor. They believed no otherwise than that it was the peasant who was saying this, and answered, That is what we intend, but first you shall look about you a little down below there. And they rolled the barrel down into the water. After the peasants went home, and as they were entering the village, the small peasant also came quietly in, driving a flock of sheep and looking quite contented. Then the peasants were astonished, and said, Peasant, from whence do you come? Have you come out of the water? Yes, truly, replied the peasant. I sank down, deep down, until at last I got to the bottom. I pushed the bottom out of the barrel and crept out and there were pretty meadows on which a number of lambs were feeding, and from thence I brought this flock away with me. Said the peasants, Are there any more there? Oh, yes, said he, more than I could want. Then the peasants made up their minds that they too would fetch some sheep for themselves, a flock apiece, but the mayor said, I come first. So they went to the water together and just then there were some of the small fleecy clouds in the blue sky, which are called little lambs, and they were reflected in the water. Whereupon the peasants cried, We already see the sheep down below. The mayor pressed forward, and said, I will go down first and look about me, and if things promise well I'll call you. So he jumped in. Splash went the water. 
It sounded as if he were calling them, and the whole crowd plunged in after him as one man. Then the entire village was dead, and the small peasant, as sole heir, became a rich man. End of The Little Peasant Frederick and Catherine From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There once was a man called Frederick. He had a wife whose name was Catherine, and they had not long been married. One day Frederick said, Kate, I am going to work in the fields. When I come back I shall be hungry, so let me have something nice cooked, and a good draught of ale. "'Very well,' said she. "'It shall all be ready.' When dinner-time drew nigh, Catherine took a nice steak, which was all the meat she had, and put it on the fire to fry. The steak soon began to look brown and to crackle in the pan, and Catherine stood by with a fork and turned it. Then she said to herself, "'The steak is almost ready. I may as well go to the cellar for the ale.' So she left the pan on the fire, and took a large jug, and went into the cellar, and tapped the ale-cask. The beer ran into the jug, and Catherine stood looking on. At last it popped into her head. The dog is not shut up. He may be running away with the steak. That's well thought of. So up she ran from the cellar, and sure enough the rascally cur had got the steak in his mouth, and was making off with it. Away ran Catherine, and away ran the dog across the field. But he ran faster than she, and stuck close to the stake. "'It's all gone, and what can't be cured must be endured,' said Catherine. So she turned round, and as she had run a good way and was tired, she walked home leisurely to cool herself. Now all this time the ale was running too, for Catherine had not turned the cock and when the jug was full the liquor ran upon the floor till the cask was empty. When she got to the cellar stairs she saw what had happened. "'My stars!' said she. "'What shall I do to keep Frederick from seeing all this slopping about?' So she thought a while, and at last remembered that there was a sack of fine meal bought at the last fair, and that if she sprinkled this over the floor it would suck up the ale nicely. "'What a lucky thing,' said she, "'that we kept that meal. We have now a good use for it.' So away she went for it, but she managed to set it down just upon the great jug full of beer and upset it, and thus all the ale that had been saved was set swimming on the floor also. "'Ah, well,' said she, "'when one goes another may as well follow.' Then she strewed the meal all about the cellar, and was quite pleased with her cleverness, and said, How very neat and clean it looks! At noon Frederick came home. Now, wife, cried he, what have you for dinner? Oh, Frederick, answered she, I was cooking you a steak, but while I went down to draw the ale the dog ran away with it, and while I ran after him the ale ran out and when I went to dry up the ale with the sack of meal that we got at the fair, I upset the jug. But now the cellar is quite dry, and looks so clean. Kate, Kate, said he, how could you do all this? Why did you leave the steak to fry, and the ale to run, and then spoil all the meal? Why, Frederick, said she, I did not know I was doing wrong. You should have told me before. The husband thought to himself, If my wife manages matters thus, I must look sharp myself. Now he had a good deal of gold in the house, so he said to Catherine, What pretty yellow buttons these are! I shall put them into a box and bury them in the garden, but take care that you never go near or meddle with them. No, Frederick, said she, that I never will. As soon as he was gone there came by some peddlers with earthenware plates and dishes, and they asked her whether she would buy. "'Oh, dear me! 
I should like to buy very much, but I have no money. If you had any use for yellow buttons, I might deal with you. Yellow buttons, said they. Oh, let us have a look at them. Go into the garden and dig where I tell you, and you will find the yellow buttons. I dare not go myself. So the rogues went, and when they found what these yellow buttons were, they took them all away, and left her plenty of plates and dishes. Then she set them all about the house for a show, and when Frederick came back, he cried out, Kate, what have you been doing? See? said she, I have bought all these with your yellow buttons. But I did not touch them myself. The peddlers went themselves and dug them up. Wife, wife, said Frederick, what a pretty piece of work you have made. Those yellow buttons were all my money. How came you to do such a thing? Why, answered she, I did not know there was any harm in it. You should have told me. Catherine stood musing for a while, and at last said to her husband, "'Hark ye, Frederick, we will soon get the gold back. Let us run after the thieves.' "'Well, we will try,' answered he, "'but take some butter and cheese with you, that we may have something to eat by the way.' "'Very well,' said she, and they set out, and as Frederick walked the fastest he left his wife some way behind. It does not matter, thought she. When we turn back, I shall be so much nearer home than he. Presently she came to the top of a hill, down the side of which there was a road so narrow that the cartwheels always chafed the trees on each side as they passed. Ah, see now, said she, how they have bruised and wounded those poor trees. They will never get well. So she took pity on them, and made use of the butter to grease them all, so that the wheels might not hurt them so much. While she was doing this kind office, one of her cheeses fell out of the basket and rolled down the hill. Catherine looked, but could not see where it had gone. So she said, Well, I suppose the other will go the same way and find you. He has younger legs than I have. Then she rolled the other cheese after it, and away it went, nobody knows where, down the hill. But she said she supposed that they knew the road and would follow her, and she could not stay there all day waiting for them. At last she overtook Frederick, who desired her to give him something to eat. Then she gave him the dry bread. Oh, where are the butter and cheese? said he. Oh, answered she, I used the butter to grease those poor trees that the wheels chafed so, and one of the cheeses ran away, so I sent the other after it to find it, and I suppose they are both on the road together somewhere. What a goose you are to do such silly things, said the husband. How can you say so, said she. I am sure you never told me not. They ate the dry bread together, and Frederick said, Kate, I hope you locked the door safe when you came away. No, answered she, you did not tell me. Then go home and do it now before we go any farther, said Frederick, and bring with you something to eat. Catherine did as he told her, and thought to herself by the way, Frederick wants something to eat but I don't think he's very fond of butter and cheese. I'll bring him a bag of fine nuts and the vinegar, for I have often seen him take some. When she reached home, she bolted the back door, but the front door she took off the hinges, and said, Frederick told me to lock the door, but surely it can nowhere be so safe if I take it with me. So she took her time by the way, and when she overtook her husband, she cried out, there, Frederick, there is the door itself. You may watch it as carefully as you please. Alas, alas, said he, what a clever wife I have. I sent you to make the house fast, and you took the door away, so that everybody may go in and out as they please. However, as you have brought the door, you shall carry it about with you for your pains. Very well, 
answered she, I'll carry the door. But I'll not carry the nuts and vinegar bottle also. That would be too much of a load. So, if you please, I'll fasten them to the door. Frederick, of course, made no objection to that plan, and they set off into the wood to look for the thieves, but they could not find them, and when it grew dark they climbed up into a tree to spend the night there. Scarcely were they up, but who should come by but the very rogues they were looking for? They were in truth great rascals, and belonged to that class of people who find things before they are lost. They were tired. So they sat down and made a fire under the very tree where Frederick and Catherine were. Frederick slipped down on the other side and picked up some stones. Then he climbed up again and tried to hit the thieves on the head with them. But they only said, It must be near morning, for the wind shakes the fir apples down. Catherine, who had the door on her shoulder, began to be very tired but she thought it was the nuts upon it that were so heavy so she said softly frederick i must let the nuts go no answered he not now they will discover us i can't help that they must go well then make haste and throw them down if you will then away rattled the nuts down among the boughs and one of the thieves cried Bless me, it is hailing. A little while after, Catherine thought the door was still very heavy, so she whispered to Frederick, I must throw the vinegar down. Pray don't, answered he, it will discover us. I can't help it, said she. Go it must. So she poured all the vinegar down. And the thieves said, What a heavy dew there is. At last it popped into Catherine's head that it was the door itself that was so heavy all the time, so she whispered, Frederick, I must throw the door down soon. But he begged and prayed her not to do so, for he was sure it would betray them. Here goes, however, said she, and down went the door with such a clatter upon the thieves that they cried out, Murder! and not knowing what was coming, ran away as fast as they could, and left all the gold. So when Frederick and Catherine came down, there they found all their money, safe and sound. End of Frederick and Catherine Sweetheart Roland from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm there was once upon a time a woman who was a real witch, and had two daughters, one ugly and wicked, and this one she loved, because she was her own daughter, and one beautiful and good, and this one she hated, because she was her stepdaughter. The stepdaughter once had a pretty apron, which the other fancied so much that she became envious, and told her mother that she must and would have that apron. Be quiet, my child, said the old woman, and you shall have it. Your stepsister has long deserved death. Tonight, when she is asleep, I will come and cut her head off. Only be careful that you are at the far side of the bed, and push her well to the front. It would have been all over with the poor girl if she had not just then been standing in a corner and heard everything. All day long she dared not go out of doors, and when bedtime had come, the witch's daughter got into bed first, so as to lie at the far side. But when she was asleep, the other pushed her gently to the front, and took for herself the place at the back, close by the wall. In the night the old woman came creeping in. She held an axe in her right hand, and felt with her left to see if anything were lying at the outside and then she grasped the axe with both hands and cut her own child's head off. When she had gone away, the girl got up and went to her sweetheart, who was called Roland, and knocked at his door. When he came out, she said to him, Listen, dearest Roland, we must fly in all haste. My stepmother wanted to kill me, but she has struck her own child. 
When daylight comes and she sees what she has done, we shall be lost. But, said Roland, I counsel you first to take away her magic wand, or we cannot escape her if she pursues us. The maiden fetched the magic wand, and she took the dead girl's head and dropped three drops of blood on the ground, one in front of the bed, one in the kitchen, and one on the stairs. Then she hurried away with her lover. When the old witch got up next morning, she called her daughter, and wanted to give her the apron, but she did not come. Then the witch cried, Where are you? Here, on the steps, I am sweeping, answered the first drop of blood. The old woman went out, but saw no one on the stairs, and cried again, Where are you? Here in the kitchen. I am warming myself, cried the second drop of blood. She went into the kitchen, but found no one. Then she cried again, Where are you? Ah, here in the bed. I am sleeping, cried the third drop of blood. She went into the room to the bed. What did she see there? Her own child, whose head she had cut off, bathed in her blood. The witch fell into a passion, sprang to the window, and as she could look forth quite far into the world, she perceived her stepdaughter hurrying away with her sweetheart, Roland. "'That shall not help you,' cried she. "'Even if you have got a long way off, you shall not escape me.' She put on her many-league boots, in which she covered an hour's walk at every step, and it was not long before she overtook them. The girl, however, when she saw the old woman striding towards her, changed with her magic wand her sweetheart Roland into a lake, and herself into a duck, swimming in the middle of it. The witch placed herself on the shore, threw breadcrumbs in, and went in endless trouble to entice the duck. But the duck did not let herself be enticed but the old woman had to go home at night as she had come. At this the girl and her sweetheart Roland resumed their natural shapes again, and they walked on the whole night until daybreak. Then the maiden changed herself into a beautiful flower which stood in the midst of a briar hedge, and her sweetheart Roland into a fiddler. It was not long before the witch came striding up towards them, and said to the musician, Dear musician, may I pluck that beautiful flower for myself? Oh, yes, he replied. I will play to you while you do it. As she was hastily creeping into the hedge, and was just going to pluck the flower, knowing perfectly well who the flower was, he began to play, and whether she would or not, she was forced to dance, for it was a magical dance. The faster he played, the more violent springs was she forced to make, and the thorns tore her clothes from her body, and pricked her and wounded her till she bled. And as she did not stop, she had to dance till she lay dead on the ground. As they were now set free, Roland said, Now I will go to my father and arrange for the wedding. Then, in the meantime, I will stay here and wait for you said the girl, and that no one may recognize me, I will change myself into a red stone landmark. Then Roland went away, and the girl stood like a red landmark in the field and waited for her beloved. But when Roland got home, he fell into the snares of another, who so fascinated him that he forgot the maiden. The poor girl remained there a long time, but at length, as he did not return at all, she was sad, and changed herself into a flower, and thought, Someone will surely come this way and trample me down. It befell, however, that a shepherd kept his sheep in the field, and saw the flower, and as it was so pretty, plucked it, took it with him, and laid it away in his chest. From that time forth strange things happened in the shepherd's house. When he arose in the morning, all the work was already done. The room was swept, the table and benches cleaned, the fire in the hearth was lighted, and the water was fetched. And at noon, when he came home, the table was laid, and a good dinner served. 
he could not conceive how this came to pass, for he never saw a human being in his house, and no one could have concealed himself in it. He was certainly pleased with this good attendance, but still at last he was so afraid that he went to a wise woman and asked for her advice. The wise woman said, There is some enchantment behind it. Listen very early some morning if anything is moving in the room, and if you see anything, no matter what it is, throw a white cloth over it, and then the magic will be stopped. The shepherd did as she bade him, and next morning, just as day dawned, he saw the chest open and the flower come out. Swiftly he sprang towards it, and threw a white cloth over it. Instantly the transformation came to an end, and a beautiful girl stood before him, who admitted to him that she had been the flower, and that up to this time she had attended to his housekeeping. She told him her story, and, as she pleased him, he asked her if she would marry him, but she answered, No, for she wanted to remain faithful to her sweetheart Roland, although he had deserted her. Nevertheless, she promised not to go away, but to continue keeping house for the shepherd. And now the time drew near when Roland's wedding was to be celebrated, and then, according to an old custom in the country, it was announced that all the girls were to be present at it, and sing in honour of the bridal pair. When the faithful maiden heard of this, she grew so sad that she thought her heart would break and she would not go thither, but the other girls came and took her. When it came her time to sing, she stepped back, until at last she was the only one left, and then she could not refuse. But when she began her song, and it reached Roland's ears, he sprang up and cried, I know the voice. That is the true bride. I will have no other. Everything he had forgotten, and which had vanished from his mind, had suddenly come home again to his heart. Then the faithful maiden held her wedding with her sweetheart, Roland, and grief came to an end, and joy began. End of Sweetheart Roland Snowdrop from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. It was the middle of winter, when the broad flakes of snow were falling around, that the queen of a country many thousand miles off sat working at her window. The frame of the window was made of fine black ebony, and as she sat looking out upon the snow, she pricked her finger, and three drops of blood fell upon it. Then she gazed thoughtfully upon the red drops that sprinkled the white snow, and said, Would that my little daughter may be as white as that snow, and as red as that blood, and as black as this ebony window-frame. And so the little girl really did grow up. Her skin was as white as snow, her cheeks as rosy as the blood, and her hair as black as ebony, and she was called Snowdrop. But this queen died, and the king soon married another wife, who became queen and was very beautiful, but so vain that she could not bear to think that any one could be handsomer than she was. She had a fairy looking-glass to which she used to go, and then she would gaze upon herself in it, and say, Tell me, glass, tell me true, of all the ladies in the land, who is the fairest? Tell me who and the glass had always answered, Thou, queen, art the fairest in all the land. But Snowdrop grew more and more beautiful, and when she was seven years old she was as bright as the day, and fairer than the queen herself. Then the glass one day answered the queen, when she went to look in it as usual, Thou, queen, art fair, and beauteous to see. But Snowdrop is lovelier far than thee. When she heard this, she turned pale with rage and envy, and called to one of her servants, and said, Take Snowdrop away into the wild wood, that I may never see her any more. Then the servant led her away, 
but his heart melted when Snowdrop begged him to spare her life, and he said, "'I will not hurt you, thou pretty child.' So he left her by herself, and though he thought it most likely that the wild beasts would tear her in pieces, he felt as if a great weight were taken off his heart when he made up his mind not to kill her, but to leave her to her fate, with the chance of some one finding and saving her. Then the poor Snowdrop wandered along through the wood in great fear, and the wild beasts roared about her, but none did her any harm. In the evening she came to a cottage among the woods, and went in to rest, for her little feet would carry her no further. Everything was spruce and neat in the cottage. On the table was spread a white cloth, and there were seven little plates, seven little loaves, and seven little glasses with wine in them, and seven knives and forks laid in order, and by the wall stood seven little beds. As she was very hungry, she picked a little piece of each loaf, and drank a very little wine out of each glass, and after that she thought she would lie down and rest. So she tried all the little beds, but one was too long and another was too short, till at last the seventh suited her, and there she laid herself down and went to sleep. By and by in came the masters of the cottage. Now they were seven little dwarfs that lived among the mountains and dug and searched for gold. They lighted up their seven lamps and saw at once that all was not right. The first said, who has been sitting on my stool? The second, who has been eating off my plate? The third, who has been picking my bread? The fourth, who has been meddling with my spoon? The fifth, who has been handling my fork? The sixth, who has been cutting with my knife? The seventh, who has been drinking my wine? Then the first looked round and said, Who has been lying on my bed? And the rest came running to him, and every one cried out that somebody had been upon his bed. But the seventh saw Snowdrop, and called all his brethren to come and see her. Then they cried out with wonder and astonishment, and brought their lamps to look at her, and said, Good heavens, what a lovely child she is! and they were very glad to see her, and took care not to wake her. And the seventh dwarf slept an hour with each of the other dwarves in turn, till the night was gone. In the morning Snowdrop told them all her story, and they pitied her, and said if she would keep all things in order, and cook and wash and knit and spin for them, she might stay where she was, and they would take good care of her. Then they went out all day long to their work, seeking for gold and silver in the mountains. But Snowdrop was left at home, and they warned her, and said, The queen will soon find out where you are, so take care, and let no one in. But the queen, now that she thought Snowdrop was dead, believed that she must be the handsomest lady in the land, and she went to her glass, and said, Tell me, glass, tell me true. Of all the ladies in the land, who is fairest? Tell me, who? And the glass answered, Thou, queen, art the fairest in all this land. But over the hills, in the greenwood shade, where the seven dwarfs their dwelling have made, there Snowdrop is hiding her head, and she is lovelier far, O queen, than thee. Then the queen was very much frightened, for she knew that the glass always spoke the truth, and was sure that the servants had betrayed her, and she could not bear to think that any one lived who was more beautiful than she was. So she dressed herself up as an old peddler, and went away over the hills, to the place where the dwarfs dwelt. Then she knocked at the door, and cried, "'Fine wares to sell!' Snowdrop looked out the window and said, "'Good day, good woman. What have you to sell?' "'Good wares, fine wares,' said she, "'laces and bobbins of all colours.' "'I will let the old lady in, 
She seems to be a very good sort of body, thought Snowdrop, as she ran down and unbolted the door. Bless me, said the old woman, how badly your stays are laced. Let me lace them up with one of my nice new laces. Snowdrop did not dream of any mischief, so she stood before the old woman, but she set to work so nimbly, and pulled the lace so tight, that Snowdrop's breath was stopped, and she fell down as if she were dead. "'There's an end to all thy beauty,' said the spiteful queen, and went away home. In the evening the seven dwarfs came home and I need not say how grieved they were to see their faithful snowdrop stretched out upon the ground, as if she was quite dead. However, they lifted her up, and when they found what ailed her, they cut the lace, and in a little time she began to breathe, and very soon came to life again. Then they said, The old woman was the queen herself. Take care another time, and let no one in while we are away. When the queen got home, she went straight to her glass, and spoke to it as before. But to her great grief it still said, Thou, queen, art the fairest in all this land. But over the hills, in the greenwood shade, where the seven dwarfs their dwelling have made, there Snowdrop is hiding her head and she is lovelier far, O oh queen, than thee. Then the blood ran cold in her heart with spite and malice to see that Snowdrop still lived, and she dressed herself up again, but in quite another dress from the one she wore before, and took with her a poisoned comb. When she reached the dwarf's cottage, she knocked at the door and cried, Fine wares to sell! But Snowdrop said, I dare not let any one in. Then the queen said, Only look at my beautiful combs, and gave her the poisoned one, and it looked so pretty that she took it up and put it into her hair to try it. But the moment it touched her head, the poison was so powerful that she fell down senseless. There you may lie, said the queen, and went her way. But by good luck the dwarfs came in very early that evening, and when they saw Snowdrop lying on the ground they thought what had happened, and soon found the poisoned comb. And when they got it away she got well, and told them all that had passed, and they warned her once more not to open the door to any one. Meantime the queen went home to her glass, and shook with rage when she read the very same answer as before and she said, Snowdrop shall die if it cost me my life. So she went by herself into her chamber, and got ready a poisoned apple. The outside looked very rosy and tempting, but whoever tasted it was sure to die. Then she dressed herself up as a peasant's wife, and travelled over the hills to the dwarf's cottage, and knocked at the door. But Snowdrop put her head out of the window, and said, I dare not let any one in, for the dwarfs have told me not. Uh, do as you please, said the old woman, but at any rate take this pretty apple. I will give it to you. No, said Snowdrop, I dare not take it. You silly girl, answered the other, what are you afraid of? Do you think it is poisoned? Come, do you eat one part, and I will eat the other. Now the apple was so made up that one side was good, though the other side was poisoned. Then Snowdrop was much tempted to taste, for the apple looked so very nice, and when she saw the old woman eat she could wait no longer. But she had scarcely put the piece into her mouth when she fell down dead upon the ground. This time nothing will save thee, said the queen, and she went home to her glass, and at last it said, Thou, queen, art the fairest of all the fair. And then her wicked heart was glad, and as happy as such a heart could be. 
When evening came and the dwarfs had gone home, they found Snowdrop lying on the ground. No breath came from her lips, and they were afraid that she was quite dead. They lifted her up and combed her hair and washed her face with wine and water, but all was in vain, for the little girl seemed quite dead. So they laid her down upon a bier, and all seven watched and bewailed her three whole days, and then they thought they would bury her. But her cheeks were still rosy, and her face looked just as it did while she was alive. So they said, We will never bury her in the cold ground. And they made a coffin of glass, so that they might still look at her, and wrote upon it in golden letters what her name was, and that she was a king's daughter. And the coffin was set among the hills, and one of the dwarfs always sat by it and watched. And the birds of the air came too, and bemoaned Snowdrop. And first of all came an owl, and then a raven, and at last a dove, and sat by her side. And thus Snowdrop lay for a long, long time, and still only looked as though she was asleep, for she was, even now, as white as snow, and as red as blood, and as black as ebony. At last a prince came, and called at the dwarf's house, and he saw Snowdrop, and read what was written in golden letters. Then he offered the dwarfs money, and prayed and besought them to let him take her away. But they said, we will not part with her for all the gold in the world. At last, however, they had pity on him and gave him the coffin. But the moment he lifted it up to carry it home with him, the piece of apple fell from beneath her lips, and Snowdrop awoke and said, Where am I? And the prince said, Thou art quite safe with me. Then he told her all that had happened and said, I love you far better than all the world, so come with me to my father's palace, and you shall be my wife. And Snowdrop consented, and went home with the prince. And everything was got ready with great pomp and splendor for their wedding. To the feast was asked, among the rest, Snowdrop's old enemy, the queen, and as she was dressing herself in fine rich clothes, she looked in the glass and said, Tell me, glass, tell me true. Of all the ladies in the land, who is the fairest? Tell me, who? And the glass answered, Thou, lady, art loveliest here, I ween, but lovelier far is the new-made queen. When she heard this, she started with rage, but her envy and curiosity were so great that she could not help setting out to see the bride. And when she got there, and saw that it was no other than Snowdrop, who, as she thought, had been dead a long while, she choked with rage, and fell down and died. But Snowdrop and the prince lived and reigned happily over that land many, many years, and sometimes they went up into the mountains and paid a visit to the little dwarfs, who had been so kind to Snowdrop in her time of need. End of Snowdrop The Pink From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There was once upon a time a queen, to whom God had given no children. Every morning she went into the garden and prayed to God in heaven to bestow on her a son or a daughter. Then an angel from heaven came to her, and said, Be at rest, you shall have a son with the power of wishing, so that whatsoever in the world he wishes for, that shall he have. Then she went to the king, and told him the joyful tidings, and when the time was come, she gave birth to a son, and the king was filled with gladness. Every morning she went with the child to the garden, where the wild beasts were kept, and washed herself there in a clear stream. It happened once, when the child was a little older, that it was lying in her arms, and she fell asleep. Then came the old cook, who knew that the child had the power of wishing, and stole it away, and he took a hen and cut it in pieces, and dropped some of its blood on the queen's apron and on her dress. 
Then he carried the child away to a secret place, where the nurse was obliged to suckle it, and he ran to the king and accused the queen of having allowed her child to be taken from her by the wild beasts. When the king saw the blood on her apron, he believed this, fell into such a passion that he ordered a high tower to be built, in which neither sun nor moon could be seen, and had his wife put into it, and walled up. Here she was to stay for seven years without meat or drink, and die of hunger. But God sent two angels from heaven, in the shape of white doves, which flew to her twice a day, and carried her food until the seven years were over. The cook, however, thought to himself, if the child has the power of wishing, and I am here, he might very easily get me into trouble. So he left the palace, and went to the boy, who was already big enough to speak, and said to him, Wish for a beautiful palace for yourself with a garden, and all else that pertains to it. Scarcely were the words out of the boy's mouth, when everything was there that he had wished for. After a while the cook said to him, it is not well for you to be so alone. Wish for a pretty girl as a companion. Then the king's son wished for one, and she immediately stood before him, and was more beautiful than any painter could have painted her. The two played together and loved each other with all their hearts, and the old cook went out hunting like a nobleman. The thought occurred to him, however, that the king's son might some day wish to be with his father and thus bring him into great peril. So he went out and took the maiden aside, and said, "'Tonight, when the boy is asleep, go to his bed and plunge this knife into his heart, and bring me his heart and tongue, and if you do not do it, you shall lose your life.' Thereupon he went away, and when he retired next day she had not done it, and said, why should I shed the blood of an innocent boy who has never harmed any one? The cook once more said, If you do not do it, it shall cost you your own life. When he had gone away, she had a little hind brought to her, and ordered her to be killed, and took her heart and tongue and laid them on a plate. And when she saw the old man coming, she said to the boy, Lie down in your bed, and draw the clothes over you when the wicked wretch came in and said, Where are the boy's heart and tongue? The girl reached the plate to him, but the king's son threw off the quilt and said, You old sinner, why did you want to kill me? Now will I pronounce thy sentence. You shall become a black poodle, and have a gold collar round your neck, and shall eat burning coals till the flames burst forth from your throat. And when he had spoken these words, the old man was changed into a poodle-dog, and had a gold collar round his neck, and the cooks were ordered to bring him some live coals, and these he ate until the flames broke forth from his throat. The king's son remained there a short while longer, and he thought of his mother, and wondered if she were still alive. At length he said to the maiden, I will go home to my own country. If you will go with me, I will provide for you. Ah, she replied, the way is so long, and what shall I do in a strange land where I am unknown? As she did not seem quite willing, and as they could not be parted from each other, he wished that she might be changed into a beautiful pink, and took her with him. Then he went away to his own country, and the poodle had to run after him. He went to the tower in which his mother was confined, and as it was so high he wished for a ladder which would reach up to the very top. Then he mounted up, and looked inside, and cried, Beloved mother, Lady Queen, are you still alive, or are you dead? She answered, I have just eaten, and am still satisfied, for she thought the angels were there. Said he, I am your dear son, whom the wild beasts were said to have torn from your arms, but I am alive still, and will soon set you free. Then he descended again, and went to his father, and caused himself to be announced as a strange huntsman, and asked if he could offer him service. 
The king said yes. If he was skilful and could get game for him, he should come to him, but that deer had never taken up their quarters in any part of the district or country. Then the huntsman promised to procure as much game for him as he could possibly use at the royal table. So he summoned all the huntsmen together, and bade them go out into the forest with him. And he went with them and made them form a great circle, open at one end where he stationed himself, and began to wish. Two hundred deer and more came running inside the circle at once, and the huntsmen shot them. Then they were all placed on sixty country carts, and driven home to the king, and for once he was able to deck the table with game, after having none at all for years. Now the king felt great joy at this, and commanded that his entire household should eat with him next day, and made a great feast. When they were all assembled together, he said to the huntsman, As you are so clever, you shall sit by me. He replied, Lord King, your majesty must excuse me. I am a poor huntsman. But the king insisted on it, and said, You shall sit by me, until he did it. Whilst he was sitting there, he thought of his dearest mother, and wished that one of the king's principal servants would begin to speak of her, and would ask how it was faring with the queen in the tower, and if she were alive still, or had perished. Hardly had he formed the wish, than the marshal began, and said, Your Majesty, we live joyously here, but how is the queen living in the tower? Is she still alive, or has she died? But the king replied, She let my dear son be torn to pieces by wild beasts. I will not have her named. Then the huntsman arose, and said, Gracious Lord Father, she is alive still and I am her son, and I was not carried away by wild beasts, but by that wretch the old cook, who tore me from her arms when she was asleep, and sprinkled her apron with the blood of a chicken. Thereupon he took the dog with the golden collar, and said, That is the wretch, and caused live coals to be brought, and these the dog was compelled to devour before the sight of all, until flames burst forth from its throat. On this the huntsman asked the king if he would like to see the dog in his true shape, and wished him back into the form of the cook, in the which he stood immediately with his white apron and his knife by his side. When the king saw him he fell into a passion, and ordered him to be cast into the deepest dungeon. Then the huntsman spoke further, and said, Father, Will you see the maiden who brought me up so tenderly, and who was afterwards to murder me, but did not do it, though her own life depended on it? The king replied, Yes, I would like to see her. The son said, Most gracious father, I will show her to you in the form of a beautiful flower. And he thrust his hand into his pocket, and brought forth the pink, and placed it on the royal table and it was so beautiful that the king had never seen one to equal it. Then the son said, Now will I show her to you in her own form, and wished that she might become a maiden, and she stood there looking so beautiful that no painter could have made her look more so. And the king sent two waiting-maids and two attendants into the tower to fetch the queen and bring her to the royal table but when she was led in she ate nothing, and said, The gracious and merciful God who has supported me in the tower will soon set me free. She lived three days more, and then died happily. And when she was buried, the two white doves, which had brought her food to the tower, and were angels of heaven, followed her body and seated themselves on her grave. The aged king ordered the cook to be torn in four pieces, but grief consumed the king's own heart, and he soon died. His son married the beautiful maiden whom he had brought with him as a flower in his pocket, and whether they are still alive or not is known to God. End of the Pink 
Clever Elsie from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. There was once a man who had a daughter who was called Clever Elsie, and when she had grown up, her father said, We will get her married. Yes, said the mother, if only someone would come who would have her. At length a man came from a distance and wooed her, who was called Hans. But he stipulated that clever Elsie should be really smart. Oh, said the father, she has plenty of good sense. And the mother said, Oh, she can see the wind coming up the street and hear the flies coughing. Well, said Hans, if she is not really smart, I won't have her. When they were sitting at dinner and had eaten, the mother said, Elsie, go into the cellar and fetch some beer. Then clever Elsie took the pitcher from the wall, went into the cellar, and tapped the lid briskly as she went, so that the time might not appear long. When she was below, she fetched herself a chair, and set it before the barrel so that she had no need to stoop, and did not hurt her back or do herself any unexpected injury. Then she placed the can before her and turned the tap, and while the beer was running she would not let her eyes be idle but looked up at the wall, and after much peering here and there, saw a pickaxe exactly above her, which the masons had accidentally left there. Then clever Elsie began to weep, and said, If I get Hans, and we have a child, and he grows big, and we send him into the cellar here to draw beer, then the pickaxe will fall on his head and kill him. Then she sat and wept and screamed with all the strength of her body over the misfortune which lay before her. Those upstairs waited for the drink, but clever Elsie still did not come. Then the woman said to the servant, Just go down into the cellar and see where Elsie is. The maid went and found her sitting in front of the barrel, screaming loudly. Elsie, why do you weep? asked the maid. Ah, oh, she answered, have I not reason to weep? If I get Hans, and we have a child, and he grows big, and has to draw beer here, the pickaxe will perhaps fall on his head and kill him. Then said the maid, what a clever Elsie we have, and sat down beside her and began loudly to weep over the misfortune. After a while, as the maid did not come back, and those upstairs were thirsty for beer, the man said to the boy, Just go down into the cellar and see where Elsie and the old girl are. The boy went down, and there sat clever Elsie and the girl both weeping together. Then he asked, Why are you weeping? Oh, said Elsie, have I not reason to weep? If I get Hans, and we have a child, and he grows big and has to draw beer here, the pickaxe will fall on his head and kill him. Then said the boy, What a clever Elsie we have, and sat down beside her, and likewise began to howl loudly. Upstairs they waited for the boy, but as he still did not return, the man said to the woman, well, Just go down into the cellar and see where Elsie is. The woman went down found all three in the midst of their lamentations, and inquired what was the cause. Then Elsie told her also that her future child was to be killed by the pickaxe, when it grew big and had to draw beer, and the pickaxe fell down. Then said the mother likewise, What a clever Elsie we have! and sat down and wept with them. The man upstairs waited a short time, but as his wife did not come back, and his thirst grew ever greater, he said, I must go down in the cellar myself, and see where Elsie is. But when he got into the cellar, and they were all sitting together crying, and he heard the reason, and that Elsie's child was the cause, and that Elsie might perhaps bring one into the world some day, and that he might be killed by the pickaxe if he should happen to be sitting beneath it, drawing beard just at the very time when it fell down, he cried, Oh, what a clever Elsie! and sat down and likewise wept with them. The bridegroom stayed upstairs alone for a long time. 
Then, as no one would come back, he thought, They must be waiting for me below. I too must go there and see what they are about. When he got down, the five of them were sitting, screaming and lamenting quite piteously, each outdoing the other. "'What misfortune has happened, then?' asked he. "'Ah, oh, dear Hans,' said Elsie, "'if we marry each other, and have a child, and he is big, and we perhaps send him here to draw something to drink, then the pickaxe, which has been left up there, might dash his brains out if it were to fall down. So have we not reason to weep? Come, said Hans, more understanding than that is not needed for my household. As you are such a clever, Elsie, I will have you, and seized her hand, took her upstairs with him, and married her. After Hans had had her for some time, he said, Wife, I am going out to work and earn some money for us. Go into the field and cut the corn that we may have some bread. Yes, dear Hans, I will do that. After Hans had gone away, she cooked herself some good broth and took it into the field with her. When she came to the field, she said to herself, Oh, what shall I do? Shall I cut first, or shall I eat first? No, oh, I, I will eat first. Then she drank her cup of broth, and when she was fully satisfied, she once more said, oh, What shall I do? Shall I cut first, or shall I sleep first? I, I will sleep first. Then she lay down among the corn and fell asleep. Hans had been at home for a long time, but Elsie did not come. Then said he, What a clever Elsie I have! She is so industrious that she does not even come home to eat. But when evening came and she still stayed away, Hans went out to see what she had cut. But nothing was cut, and she was lying among the corn asleep. Then Hans hastened home and brought a fowler's net with little bells and hung it round about her, and she still went on sleeping. Then he ran home, shut the house door, and sat down in his chair and worked. At length, when it was quite dark, clever Elsie awoke, and when she got up there was a jingling all round about her, and the bells rang at each step which she took. Then she was alarmed, and became uncertain whether she really was clever Elsie or not, and said, Is it I, or is it not I? But she knew not what answer to make to this, and stood for a time in doubt. At length she thought, I will go home, and ask if it be I, or if it be not I. They will be sure to know. She ran to the door of her own house, but it was shut. Then she knocked at the window, and cried, Hans, is Elsie within? Yes, answered Hans, she is within. Hereupon she was terrified, and said, Ah, oh, heavens, that it is not I, and went to another door. But when the people heard the jingling of the bells, they would not open it, and she could get in nowhere. Then she ran out of the village, and no one has seen her since. End of Clever Elsie The Miser in the Bush From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm a farmer had a faithful and diligent servant, who had worked hard for him three years, without having been paid any wages. At last it came into the man's head that he would not go on thus without pay any longer. So he went to his master and said, I have worked hard for you a long time. I will trust you to give me what I deserve to have for my trouble. The farmer was a sad miser, and knew that this man was very simple-hearted, so he took out threepence and gave him for every year's service a penny. The poor fellow thought it was a great deal of money to have, and said to himself, Why should I work hard and live here on bad fare any longer? I can now travel into the wide world and make myself merry. With that he put his money into his purse and set out, roaming over hill and valley. As he jogged along over the fields, singing and dancing, a little dwarf met him, 
and asked him what made him so merry. "'Why, what should make me downhearted?' said he. "'I am sound in health and rich in purse. What should I care for? I have saved up my three years' earnings, and have it all safe in my pocket.' "'How much may it come to?' said the little man. "'A full threepence," replied the countryman. "'I wish you would give them to me,' said the other. "'I am very poor.' Then the man pitied him, and gave him all he had, and the little dwarf said in return, "'As you have such a kind, honest heart, I will grant you three wishes, one for every penny. So choose whatever you like.' Then the countryman rejoiced at his good luck, and said, "'I like many things better than money. First, I will have a bow that will bring down everything I shoot at. Secondly, a fiddle that will set every one dancing that hears me play upon it. And thirdly, I should like that every one should grant what I ask.' The dwarf said he should have these three wishes. So he gave him the bow and fiddle, and went his way. Our honest friend journeyed on his way, too, and if he was merry before, he was now ten times more so. He had not gone far before he met an old miser. Close by them stood a tree, and on the topmost twig sat a thrush, singing away almost joyfully. "'Oh, what a pretty bird!' said the miser. I would give a great deal of money to have such a one. If that's all, said the countryman, I will soon bring it down. Then he took up his bow, and down fell the thrush into the bushes at the foot of the tree. The miser crept into the bush to find it, but directly he had got into the middle, his companion took up his fiddle and played away, and the miser began to dance and spring about, capering higher and higher in the air. The thorns soon began to tear his clothes, till they all hung in rags about him, and he himself was all scratched and wounded, so that the blood ran down. "'Oh, for heaven's sake!' cried the miser. "'Master! Master! Pray let the fiddle alone! What have I done to deserve this?' "'Thou hast shaved many a poor soul close enough,' said the other. Thou art only meeting thy reward. So he played up another tune. Then the miser began to beg and promise, and offered money for his liberty. But he did not come up to the musician's price for some time, and he danced him along brisker and brisker, and the miser bid higher and higher, till at last he offered a round hundred of florins that he had in his purse, and had just gained by cheating some poor fellow. When the countryman saw so much money, he said, I will agree to your proposal. So he took up the purse, put up his fiddle, and travelled on very pleased with his bargain. Meanwhile the miser crept out of the bush half-naked and in a piteous plight, and began to ponder how he should take his revenge and serve his late companion some trick. At last he went to the judge and complained that a rascal had robbed him of his money, and beaten him into the bargain, and that the fellow who did it carried a bow on his back, and a fiddle hung round his neck. Then the judge sent his officers to bring up the accused wherever they should find him, and he was soon caught and brought up to be tried. The miser began to tell his tale, and said he had been robbed of his money. No, you gave it to me for playing a tune to you said the countryman. But the judge told him that was not likely, and cut the matter short by ordering him off to the gallows. So away he was taken. But as he stood on the steps, he said, My lord judge, grant me one last request. Anything but thy life, replied the other. No, said he, I do not ask my life only to let me play upon my fiddle for the last time. The miser cried out, Oh, no, no! For heaven's sake, don't listen to him! Don't listen to him! But the judge said, It is only this once. He will soon have done. 
The fact was he could not refuse the request, on account of the dwarf's third gift. Then the miser said, Bind me fast, bind me fast, for pity's sake. But the countryman seized his fiddle and struck up a tune, and at the first note judge, clerks, and jailer were in motion. All began capering, and no one could hold the miser. At the second note the hangman let his prisoner go and danced also, and by the time he had played the first bar of the tune all were dancing together, judge, court, and miser, and all the people who had followed to look on. At first the thing was merry and pleasant enough, but when it had gone on a while, and there seemed to be no end of playing or dancing, they began to cry out and beg him to leave off. But he stopped not a whit, the more for their entreaties, till the judge not only gave him his life, but promised to return him the hundred florins. Then he called to the miser, and said, Tell us now, you vagabond, where you got that gold, or I shall play on for your amusement only. I stole it, said the miser in the presence of all the people. I acknowledge that I stole it, and that you earned it fairly. Then the countryman stopped his fiddle, and left the miser to take his place at the gallows. End of The Miser in the Bush Ashputtel from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm The wife of a rich man fell sick, and when she felt that her end drew nigh, she called her only daughter to her bedside, and said, Always be a good girl, and I will look down from heaven and watch over you. Soon afterwards she shut her eyes and died, and was buried in the garden, and the little girl went every day to her grave and wept, and was always good and kind to all about her. And the snow fell and spread a beautiful white covering over the grave. But by the time the spring came and the sun had melted it away, her father had married another wife. This new wife had two daughters of her own that she brought home with her. They were fair in face, but foul at heart, and it was now a sorry time for the poor little girl. "'What does the good-for-nothing want in the parlour? said they. "'They who eat bread should first earn it. Away with the kitchen-maid!' Then they took away her fine clothes, and gave her an old grey frock to put on, and laughed at her, and turned her into the kitchen. There she was forced to do hard work, to rise early before daylight, to bring the water, to make the fire, to cook, and to wash. Besides that, the sisters plagued her in all sorts of ways, and laughed at her. In the evening, when she was tired, she had no bed to lie down on, but was made to lie by the hearth among the ashes, and, as this, of course, made her always dusty and dirty, they called her Ashputtle. It happened once that the father was going to the fair, and asked his wife's daughters what he should bring them. "'Fine clothes,' said the first. "'Pearls and diamonds,' cried the second. "'Now, child,' said he to his own daughter, "'what will you have?' "'The first twig, dear father, that brushes against your hat when you turn your face to come homewards,' said she. Then he bought for the first two the fine clothes and pearls and diamonds they had asked for and on his way home, as he rode through a green copse, a hazel twig brushed against him, and almost pushed off his hat. So he broke it off and brought it away, and when he got home he gave it to his daughter. Then she took it and went to her mother's grave and planted it there, and cried so much that it was watered with her tears, and there it grew and became a fine tree. Three times every day she went to it and cried, and soon a little bird came and built its nest upon the tree, and talked with her, and watched over her, and brought her whatever she wished for. Now it happened that the king of that land held a feast, which was to last three days, and out of those who came to it his son was to choose a bride for himself. 
Ashputtle's two sisters were asked to come. So they called her up and said, Now comb our hair, brush our shoes, and tie our sashes for us, for we are going to dance at the king's feast. Then she did as she was told. But when all was done, she could not help crying, for she thought to herself she should so have liked to have gone with them to the ball, and at last she begged her mother very hard to let her go. "'You, Ashpuddle, said she, "'you who have nothing to wear, no clothes at all, and who cannot even dance, you want to go to the ball?' And when she kept on begging, she said at last, to get rid of her, I will throw this dishful of peas into the ash-heap, and if in two hours' time you have picked them all out, you shall go to the feast too. Then she threw the peas down into the ashes, but the little maiden ran out of the back door into the garden, and cried out, Hither, hither, through the sky, turtle-doves and linnets fly, blackbird, thrush, and chaffinch gay, hither, hither, haste away. One and all, come help me, quick, haste ye, haste ye, pick, pick, pick. Then first came two white doves, flying in at the kitchen window. Next came two turtle doves, and after them came all the little birds under heaven, chirping and fluttering in, and they flew down into the ashes, and the little doves stooped their heads down and set to work, pick, pick, pick and then the others began to pick, 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 and among them all they soon picked out all the good grain and put it into a dish, but left the ashes. Long before the end of the hour the work was quite done, and all flew out again at the windows. Then Ashputtle brought the dish to her mother, overjoyed at the thought that now she could go to the ball. But the mother said, no, no, you wench, you have no clothes, and cannot dance. You shall not go. And when Ashputtle begged very hard to go, she said, If you can in one hour's time pick two of these dishes of peas out of the ashes, you shall go too. And thus she thought she should at least get rid of her. So she shook two dishes of peas into the ashes. But the little maiden went out into the garden at the back of the house, and cried out as before, Hither, hither, through the sky, turtle-doves and linnets fly, blackbird, thrush, and chaffinch gay, hither, hither, haste away. One and all, come help me, quick, haste ye, haste ye, pick, pick, pick. Then first came two white doves in at the kitchen window. Next came two turtle-doves, and after them came all the little birds under heaven, chirping and hopping about. And they flew down into the ashes, and the little doves put their heads down and set to work, pick, 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 and then the others began, pick, 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 and they put all the good grain into the dishes and left all the ashes. Before half an hour's time all was done, and out they flew again. And then Ashputtle took the dishes to her mother, rejoicing to think that she should now go to the ball. But her mother said, It is all of no use. You cannot go. You have no clothes and cannot dance, and you would only put us to shame. And off she went with her two daughters to the ball. Now when all were gone and nobody left at home, Ashputtle went sorrowfully and sat down under the hazel tree and cried out, Shake, shake, hazel tree, gold and silver over me. Then her friend the bird flew out of the tree and brought a gold and silver dress for her and slippers of spangled silk, and she put them on and followed her sisters to the feast. But they did not know her and thought it must be some strange princess. She looked so fine and beautiful in her rich clothes, and they never once thought of Ashputtle, taking it for granted that she was safe at home in the dirt. The king's son soon came up to her, and took her by the hand, and danced with her, and no one else, and he never left her hand, and when anyone else came to ask her to dance, he said, This lady is dancing with me. Thus they danced till a late hour of the night 
and then she wanted to go home. And the king's son said, I shall go and take care of you to your home, for he wanted to see where the beautiful maiden lived. But she slipped away from him, unawares, and ran off towards home. And as the prince followed her, she jumped up into the pigeon-house and shut the door. And then he waited till her father came home, and told him that the unknown maiden who had been at the feast had hid herself in the pigeon-house. But when they had broken open the door, they found no one within, and as they came back into the house, Ashputtel was lying, as she always did, in her dirty frock by the ashes, and her dim little lamp was burning in the chimney. For she had run as quickly as she could through the pigeon-house and on to the hazel-tree, and had there taken off her beautiful clothes and put them beneath the tree, that the bird might carry them away, and had lain down again amid the ashes in her little grey frock. The next day, when the feast was again held, and her father, mother, and sisters were gone, Ashputtel went to the hazel-tree and said, Shake, shake, hazel-tree, gold and silver over me. And the bird came and brought a still finer dress than the one she had worn the day before. And when she came in it to the ball, every one wondered at her beauty. But the king's son, who was waiting for her, took her by the hand and danced with her. And when any one asked her to dance, he said, as before, This lady is dancing with me. When night came, she wanted to go home, and the king's son followed her, as before, that he might see into what house she went. But she sprang away from him all at once into the garden behind her father's house. In this garden stood a fine large pear tree full of ripe fruit, and Ashputtel, not knowing where to hide herself, jumped up into it without being seen. Then the king's son lost sight of her, and could not find out where she was gone, but waited till her father came home, and said to him, The unknown lady who danced with me has slipped away, and I think she must have sprung into the pear-tree. The father thought to himself, Can it be Ashputtel? So he had an axe brought, and they cut down the tree, but found no one upon it. And when they came back into the kitchen, there lay Ashputtel among the ashes, for she had slipped down on the other side of the tree, and carried her beautiful clothes back to the bird at the hazel tree, and then put on her little grey frock. The third day, when her father and mother and sisters were gone, she went again into the garden, and said, Shake, shake, hazel tree, gold and silver over me. Then her kind friend the bird brought a dress still finer than the former one, and slippers which were all of gold, so that when she came to the feast no one knew what to say, for wonder at her beauty. And the king's son danced with nobody but her, and when any one else asked her to dance, he said, This lady is my partner, sir. When night came she wanted to go home and the king's son would go with her, and said to himself, I will not lose her this time. But, however, she again slipped away from him, though in such a hurry that she dropped her left golden slipper upon the stairs. The prince took the shoe, and went the next day to the king his father, and said, I will take for my wife the lady that this golden slipper fits. Then both the sisters were overjoyed to hear it, for they had beautiful feet, and had no doubt that they could wear the golden slipper. The eldest went first into the room where the slipper was, and wanted to try it on, and the mother stood by. But her great toe could not go into it, and the shoe was altogether much too small for her. Then the mother gave her a knife, and said, Never mind, cut it off. When you are queen you will not care about toes. You will not want to walk. So the silly girl cut off her great toe, and thus squeezed on the shoe and went to the king's son. Then he took her for his bride, and sat her beside him on his horse, and rode away with her homewards. But on their way home they had to pass by the hazel tree that Ashputtel had planted, and on the branch sat a little dove singing. Back again, back again, look to the shoe. The shoe is too small and not made for you. 
Prince, prince, look again for thy bride, for she's not the true one that sits by thy side. Then the prince got down and looked at her foot, and he saw by the blood that streamed from it what a trick she had played him. So he turned his horse round and brought the false bride back to her home, and said, This is not the right bride. Let the other sister try and put on the slipper. Then she went into the room and got her foot into the shoe, all but the heel, which was too large. But her mother squeezed it in till the blood came, and took her to the king's son, and he set her as his bride by his side on his horse, and rode away with her. But when they came to the hazel tree, the little dove sat there still, and sang, Back again, back again, look to the shoe, the shoe is too small and not made for you. Prince, prince, look again for thy bride, for she's not the true one that sits by thy side. Then he looked down, and saw that the blood streamed so much from the shoe that her white stockings were quite red. So he turned his horse and brought her also back again. This is not the true bride, said he to the father. Have you no other daughters? No, said he. There is only a little dirty ash puddle here, the, the child of my first wife. I am sure she cannot be the bride. The prince told him to send her, but the mother said, No, no, she is much too dirty. She will not dare to show herself. However, the prince would have her come, and she first washed her face and hands, and then went in and curtsied to him, and he reached her the golden slipper. Then she took her clumsy shoe off her left foot and put on the golden slipper, and it fitted her as if it had been made for her and when he drew near and looked at her face, he knew her, and said, This is the right bride. But the mother and both the sisters were frightened, and turned pale with anger as he took Ashputtel on his horse, and rode away with her. And when they came to the hazel tree, the white dove sang, Home, home, look at the shoe, princess, the shoe was made for you. Prince, prince, take home thy bride, for she is the true one who sits by thy side. And when the dove had done its song, it came flying, and perched upon her right shoulder, and so went home with her. End of Ashputtel The White Snake From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm a long time ago there lived a king who was famed for his wisdom through all the land. Nothing was hidden from him, and it seemed as if news of the most secret things were brought to him through the air. But he had a strange custom. Every day after dinner, when the table was cleared and no one else was present, a trusty servant had to bring him one more dish. It was covered, however, and even the servant did not know what was in it, neither did any one know, for the king never took off the cover to eat of it until he was quite alone. This had gone on for a long time, when one day the servant who took away the dish was overcome with such curiosity that he could not help carrying the dish into his room. When he had carefully locked the door, he lifted up the cover and saw a white snake lying on the dish but when he saw it he could not deny himself the pleasure of tasting it, so he cut off a little bit and put it into his mouth. No sooner had it touched his tongue than he heard a strange whispering of little voices outside his window. He went and listened, and then noticed that it was the sparrows who were chattering together, and telling one another of all kinds of things which they had seen in the fields and woods. Eating the snake had given him power of understanding the language of animals. Now it so happened that on this very day the queen lost her most beautiful ring, and suspicion of having stolen it fell upon this trusty servant, who was allowed to go everywhere. The king ordered the man to be brought before him, and threatened with angry words that unless he could before the morrow point out the thief he himself should be looked upon as guilty and executed. 
In vain he declared his innocence. He was dismissed with no better answer. In his trouble and fear he went down into the courtyard, and took thought how to help himself out of his trouble. Now some ducks were sitting together quietly by a brook and taking their rest, and whilst they were making their feathers smooth with their bills, they were having a confidential conversation together. The servant stood by and listened. They were telling one another of all the places where they had been waddling about all the morning, and what good food they had found, and one said in a pitiful tone, "'Something lies heavy on my stomach. As I was eating in haste I swallowed a ring, which lay upon the queen's window.' The servant at once seized her by the neck, carried her to the kitchen, and said to the cook, "'Here is a fine duck. Pray kill her.' "'Yes.' said the cook, and weighed her in his hand. She has spared no trouble to fatten herself, and has been waiting to be roasted long enough. So he cut off her head, and as she was being dressed for the spit, the queen's ring was found inside her. The servant could now easily prove his innocence, and the king, to make amends for the wrong, allowed him to ask a favor, and promised him the best place in the court that he could wish for. The servant refused everything and only asked for a horse and some money for travelling, as he had a mind to see the world and go about a little. When his request was granted he set out on his way, and one day came to a pond where he saw three fishes caught in the reeds and gasping for water. Now, though it is said that fishes are mute, he heard them lamenting that they must perish so miserably, and as he had a kind heart he got off his horse and put the three prisoners back into the water. They leaped with delight, put out their heads, and cried to him, We will remember you and repay you for saving us. He rode on, and after a while it seemed to him that he heard a voice in the sand at his feet. He listened and heard an ant-king complain, Why cannot folks with their clumsy beasts keep off our bodies? That stupid horse with his heavy hoofs has been treading down my people without mercy. So he turned on to a side-path, and the ant-king cried out to him, We will remember you. One good turn deserves another. The path led him into a wood, and there he saw two ravens standing by their nest and throwing out their young ones. Out with you, you idle good-for-nothing creatures! cried they. We cannot find food for you any longer. You are big enough and can provide for yourselves. But the poor young ravens lay upon the ground, flapping their wings, and crying, Oh, what helpless chicks we are! We must shift for ourselves, and yet we cannot fly. What can we do but lie here and starve? So the good young fellow alighted and killed his horse with his sword, and gave it to them for food. Then they came hopping up to it, satisfied their hunger, and cried, we will remember you. One good turn deserves another. And now he had to use his own legs, and when he had walked a long way he came to a large city. There was a great noise and crowd in the streets, and a man rode up on horseback, crying aloud, The king's daughter wants a husband, but whoever seeks her hand must perform a hard task, and if he does not succeed he will forfeit his life. Many had already made the attempt, but in vain. Nevertheless, when the youth saw the king's daughter, he was so overcome by her great beauty that he forgot all danger, went before the king, and declared himself a suitor. So he was led out to the sea, and a gold ring was thrown into it before his eyes. Then the king ordered him to fetch this ring up from the bottom of the sea, and added, If you come up again without it, you will be thrown in again and again until you perish amid the waves. All the people grieved for the handsome youth. Then they went away, leaving him alone by the sea. He stood on the shore and considered what he should do, when suddenly he saw three fishes come swimming towards him, and they were the very fishes whose lives he had saved. The one in the middle held a mussel in its mouth, which it laid on the shore at the youth's feet, and when he had taken it up and opened it, there lay the gold ring in the shell. 
Full of joy, he took it to the king, and expected that he would grant him the promised reward. But when the proud princess perceived that he was not her equal in birth, she scorned him, and required him first to perform another task. She went down into the garden, and strewed with her own hands ten sacks full of millet-seed on the grass. Then she said, "'Tomorrow morning, before sunrise, these must be picked up, and not a single grain be wanting.' The youth sat down in the garden, and considered how it might be possible to perform this task. But he could think of nothing, and there he sat sorrowfully awaiting the break of day, when he should be led to death. But as soon as the first rays of the sun shone into the garden, he saw all the ten sacks standing side by side, quite full, and not a single grain was missing. The ant-king had come in the night with thousands and thousands of ants, and the grateful creatures had by great industry picked up all the millet-seed and gathered them into the sacks. Presently the king's daughter herself came down into the garden, and was amazed to see that the young man had done the task she had given him. But she could not yet conquer her proud heart, and said, Although he has performed both the tasks, he shall not be my husband until he has brought me an apple from the tree of life. The youth did not know where the tree of life stood, but he set out, and would have gone on for ever, as long as his legs would carry him, though he had no hope of finding it. After he had wandered through three kingdoms, he came one evening to a wood, and lay down under a tree to sleep. But he heard a rustling in the branches, and a golden apple fell into his hand. At the same time three ravens flew down to him, perched themselves upon his knee, and said, "'We are the three young ravens whom you saved from starving. When we had grown big, and heard that you were seeking the golden apple, we flew over the sea to the end of the world, where the tree of life stands, and have brought you the apple.' The youth, full of joy, set out homewards, and took the golden apple to the king's beautiful daughter, who had now no more excuses left to make. They cut the apple of life in two, and ate it together, and then her heart became full of love for him, and they lived in undisturbed happiness to a great age. End of The White Snake The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There was once upon a time an old goat who had seven little kids, and loved them with all the love of a mother for her children. One day she wanted to go into the forest and fetch some food, so she called all seven to her and said, Dear children, I have to go into the forest. Be on your guard against the wolf. If he comes in, he will devour you all, skin, hair, and everything. The wretch often disguises himself, but you will know him at once by his rough voice and his black feet. The kids said, Dear mother, we will take good care of ourselves. You may go away without any anxiety. Then the old one bleated and went on her way with an easy mind. It was not long before some one knocked at the house door, and called, "'Open the door, dear children. Your mother is here, and has brought something back with her for each of you.' But the little kids knew that it was the wolf by the rough voice. "'We will not open the door,' cried they. "'You are not our mother. She has a soft, pleasant voice, but your voice is rough. You are the wolf.' Then the wolf went away to a shopkeeper, and bought himself a great lump of chalk, ate this, and made his voice soft with it. Then he came back, knocked at the door of the house, and called, "'Open the door, dear children, and your mother is here, and has brought something back with her for each of you.' But the wolf had laid his black paws against the window, and the children saw them, and cried, "'We will not open the door.' Our mother has not black feet like you. You are the wolf. Then the wolf ran to a baker and said, I have hurt my feet. Rub some dough over them for me. And when the baker had rubbed his feet over, he ran to the miller and said, Strew some white meal over my feet for me. The miller thought to himself, 
the wolf wants to deceive someone and refused but the wolf said if you will not do it i will devour you then the miller was afraid and made his paws white for him truly this is the way of mankind so now the wretch went for the third time to the house door knocked at it and said open the door for me children your dear little mother has come home and has brought every one of you something back from the forest with her the little kids cried first show us your paws that we may know if you are our dear little mother then he put his paws in through the window and when the kids saw that they were white they believed that all he said was true and opened the door but who should come in but the wolf they were terrified and wanted to hide themselves one sprang under the table the second into the bed the third into the stove the fourth into the kitchen the fifth into the cupboard the sixth under the washing bowl and the seventh into the clock case but the wolf found them all and used no great ceremony one after the other he swallowed them down his throat the youngest who was in the clock case was the only one he did not find when the wolf had satisfied his appetite, he took himself off, laid himself down under a tree in the green meadow outside, and began to sleep. Soon afterwards the old goat came home again from the forest. Ah, what a sight she saw there! The house door stood wide open, the table, chairs, and benches were thrown down, the washing-bowl lay broken to pieces, and the quilts and pillows were pulled off the bed. She sought her children, but they were nowhere to be found. She called them one after another by name, but no one answered. At last, when she came to the youngest, a soft voice cried, "'Dear mother, I am in the clock-case.' She took the kid out, and it told her that the wolf had come and eaten all the others. Then you may imagine how she wept over her poor children." At length, in her grief, she went out, and the youngest kid ran with her. When they came to the meadow, there lay the wolf by the tree, and snored so loud that the branches shook. She looked at him on every side, and saw that something was moving and struggling in his gorged belly. "'Ah, heavens!' she said. "'Is it possible that my poor children, whom he has swallowed down for his supper, can still be alive?' Then the kid had to run home and fetch scissors, and a needle and thread, and the goat cut open the monster's stomach, and hardly had she made one cut than one little kid thrust its head out, and when she had cut farther, all six sprang out, one after another, and were all still alive, and had suffered no injury whatever, for in his greediness the monster had swallowed them down whole. What rejoicing there was! They embraced their dear mother, and jumped like a tailor at his wedding. The mother, however, said, "'Now go and look for some big stones, and we will fill the wicked beast's stomach with them while he is still asleep.' Then the seven kids dragged the stones thither with all speed, and put as many of them into his stomach as they could get in, and the mother sewed him up again in the greatest haste, so that he was not aware of anything.' and never once stirred. When the wolf at length had had his fill of sleep, he got on his legs, and as the stones in his stomach made him very thirsty, he wanted to go to a well to drink. But when he began to walk and to move about, the stones in his stomach knocked against each other and rattled. Then cried he, What rumbles and tumbles against my poor bones! I thought twas six kids! but it feels like big stones. And when he got to the well and stooped over the water to drink, the heavy stones made him fall in, and he drowned miserably. When the seven kids saw that, they were running for the spot and cried aloud, The wolf is dead! The wolf is dead! and danced for joy round about the well with their mother. End of The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids The Queen Bee from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. 
Two kings' sons, once upon a time, went into the world to seek their fortunes, but they soon fell into a wasteful, foolish way of living, so that they could not return home again. Then their brother, who was a little insignificant dwarf, went out to seek for his brothers. But when he found them, they only laughed at him, to think that he, who was so young and simple, should try to travel through the world, when they, who were so much wiser, had been unable to get on. However, they all set out on their journey together, and came at last to an ant hill. The two elder brothers would have pulled it down, in order to see how the poor ants in their fright would run about and carry off their eggs. But the little dwarf said, Let the poor things enjoy themselves. I will not suffer you to trouble them. So on they went, and came to a lake where many, many ducks were swimming about. The two brothers wanted to catch two and roast them. But the dwarf said, Let the poor things enjoy themselves. You shall not kill them. Next they came to a bee's nest in a hollow tree, and there was so much honey that it ran down the trunk, and the two brothers wanted to light a fire under the tree and kill the bees so as to get their honey. But the dwarf held them back and said, Let the pretty insects enjoy themselves. I cannot let you burn them. At length the three brothers came to a castle. As they passed by the stables, they saw fine horses standing there, but all were of marble, and no man was to be seen. Then they went through the rooms till they came to a door on which were three locks, but in the middle of the door was a wicket, so that they could look into the next room. There they saw a little grey old man sitting at a table, and they called to him once or twice, but he did not hear. However, they called a third time, and then he rose and came out to them. He said nothing, but took hold of them, and led them to a beautiful table covered with all sorts of good things, and when they had eaten and drunk, he showed each of them to a bedchamber. The next morning he came to the eldest and took him to a marble table, where there were three tablets containing an account of the means by which the castle might be disenchanted. The first tablet said, in the wood, under the moss, lie the thousand pearls belonging to the king's daughter. They must all be found, and if one be missing by set of sun, he who seeks them will be turned into marble. The eldest brother set out and sought for the pearls the whole day. But the evening came, and he had not found the first hundred, so he was turned into stone, as the tablet had foretold. The next day the second brother undertook the task but he succeeded no better than the first, for he could only find the second hundred of the pearls, and therefore he too was turned into stone. At last came the little dwarf's turn, and he looked in the moss. But it was so hard to find the pearls, and the job was so tiresome, so he sat down upon a stone and cried. And as he sat there, the king of the ants, whose life he had saved, came to help him, with five thousand ants, and it was not long before they had found all the pearls and laid them in a heap. The second tablet said, The key of the princess's bedchamber must be fished up out of the lake, and as the dwarf came to the brink of it, he saw the two ducks whose lives he had saved swimming about, and they dived down and soon brought in the key from the bottom. The third task was the hardest. It was to choose out the youngest and the best of the king's three daughters. Now they were all beautiful, and all exactly alike, but he was told that the eldest had eaten a piece of sugar, the next some sweet syrup, and the youngest a spoonful of honey, so he was to guess which it was that had eaten the honey. Then came the queen of the bees, who had been saved by the little dwarf from the fire, and she tried the lips of all three, but at last she sat upon the lips of the one that had eaten the honey and so the dwarf knew which was the youngest. Thus the spell was broken, and all who had been turned into stones awoke, and took their proper forms. And the dwarf married the youngest and best of the princesses, and was king after her father's death. But his brothers married the other two sisters. End of the Queen Bee The Elves and the Shoemaker From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There once was a shoemaker 
who worked very hard and was very honest, but still he could not earn enough to live upon, and at last all he had in the world was gone save just leather enough to make one pair of shoes. Then he cut his leather out, all ready to make up the next day, meaning to rise early in the morning to his work. His conscience was clear and his heart light amidst all his troubles, so he went peaceably to bed, left all his cares to heaven, and soon fell asleep. In the morning, after he had said his prayers, he set himself down to his work, when to his great wonder there stood the shoes already made, upon the table. The good man knew not what to say or think at such an odd thing happening. He looked at the workmanship. There was not one false stitch in the whole job. All was so neat and true that it was quite a masterpiece. The same day a customer came in, and the shoes suited him so well that he willingly paid a price higher than usual for them. And the poor shoemaker, with the money, bought leather enough to make two pairs more. In the evening he cut out the work and went to bed early, that he might get up and begin betimes next day. But he was saved all the trouble, for when he got up in the morning the work was done, ready to his hand. Soon in came buyers, who paid him handsomely for his goods, so that he bought leather enough for four pair more. He cut out the work again overnight, and found it done in the morning, as before. And so it went on for some time. What was got ready in the evening was always done by daybreak, and the good man soon became thriving and well off again. One evening, about Christmas time, as he and his wife were sitting over the fire chatting together, he said to her, I should like to sit up and watch to-night, that we may see who it is that comes and does my work for me. The wife liked the thought, so they left the light burning, and hid themselves in a corner of the room, behind a curtain that was hung up there, and watched what would happen. As soon as it was midnight, there came in two little naked dwarfs, and they sat themselves upon the shoemaker's bench, took up all the work that was cut out, and began to ply with their little fingers, stitching and rapping and tapping away at such a rate that the shoemaker was all wonder, and could not take his eyes off them. And on they went, till the job was quite done, and the shoes stood ready for use upon the table. This was long before daybreak, and then they bustled away as quick as lightning. The next day the wife said to the shoemaker, "'Those little whites have made us rich, and we ought to be thankful to them, and do them a good turn if we can.' I am quite sorry to see them run about as they do, and indeed it is not very decent, for they have nothing upon their backs to keep off the cold. I'll tell you what, I will make each of them a shirt, and a coat, and a waistcoat, and a pair of pantaloons into the bargain, and do you make each of them a little pair of shoes. The thought pleased the old cobbler very much, and one evening, when all the things were ready, they laid them on the table, instead of the work that they used to cut out, and then went out and hid themselves, to watch what the little elves would do. About midnight in they came, dancing and skipping, hopping round the room, and then went to sit down to their work as usual. But when they saw the clothes lying for them, they laughed and chuckled, and seemed mightily delighted. Then they dressed themselves in the twinkling of an eye, and danced and capered and sprang about as merry as could be, till at last they danced out the door and away over the green. The good couple saw them no more, but everything went well with them from that time forward, as long as they lived. End of the Elves and the Shoemaker The Juniper Tree from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Long, long ago, some two thousand years or so, there lived a rich man with a good and beautiful wife. They loved each other dearly, but sorrowed much that they had no children. So greatly did they desire to have one that the wife prayed for it day and night, but still they remained childless. In front of the house there was a court, 
in which grew a juniper tree. One winter's day the wife stood under the tree to peel some apples, and as she was peeling them she cut her finger, and the blood fell on the snow. Ah, sighed the woman heavily, if I had but a child as red as blood and as white as snow. And as she spoke the words her heart grew light within her, and it seemed to her that her wish was granted, and she returned to the house feeling glad and comforted. A month passed, and the snow had all disappeared. Then another month went by, and all the earth was green. So the months followed one another, and first the trees budded in the woods, and soon the green branches grew thickly intertwined, and then the blossoms began to fall. Once again the wife stood under the juniper tree, and it was so full of sweet scent that her heart leaped for joy, and she was so overcome with her happiness that she fell on her knees. Presently the fruit became round and firm, and she was glad and at peace. And when they were fully ripe she picked the berries and ate eagerly of them, and then she grew sad and ill. A little while later she called her husband, and said to him, weeping, If I die, bury me under the juniper tree. Then she felt comforted and happy again, and before another month had passed she had a little child, and when she saw that it was as white as snow and as red as blood, her joy was so great that she died. Her husband buried her under the juniper tree and wept bitterly for her. By degrees, however, his sorrow grew less, and although at times he still grieved over his loss, he was able to go about as usual, and later on he married again. He now had a little daughter born to him. The child of his first wife was a boy, who was as red as blood and as white as snow. The mother loved her daughter very much, and when she looked at her and then looked at the boy, it pierced her heart to think that he would always stand in the way of her own child, and she was continually thinking how she could get the whole of the property for her. This evil thought took possession of her more and more, and made her behave very unkindly to the boy. She drove him from place to place with cuffings and buffetings, so that the poor child went about in fear, and had no peace from the time he left school to the time he went back. One day the little daughter came running to her mother in the storeroom, and said, "'Mother, give me an apple.' "'Yes, my child,' said the wife, and she gave her a beautiful apple out of the chest. The chest had a very heavy lid and a large iron lock. "'Mother,' said the little girl again, "'may not brother have one too?' The mother was angry at this, but she answered, "'Yes, when he comes out of school.' Just then she looked out of the window and saw him coming, and it seemed as if an evil spirit entered into her, for she snatched the apple out of her little daughter's hand and said, You shall not have one before your brother. She threw the apple into the chest and shut it too. The little boy now came in, and the evil spirit in the wife made her say kindly to him, My son, will you have an apple? but she gave him a wicked look. "'Mother,' said the boy, "'how dreadful you look! Yes, give me an apple.' The thought came to her that she should kill him. "'Come with me,' she said, and she lifted up the lid of the chest. "'Take one out for yourself.' And as he bent over to do so, the evil spirit urged her, and crash! Down went the lid, and off went the little boy's head. Then she was overwhelmed with fear at the thought of what she had done. "'If only I can prevent any one knowing that I did it,' she thought. So she went upstairs to her room, and took a white handkerchief out of her top drawer. Then she set the boy's head again on his shoulders, and bound it with the handkerchief, so that nothing could be seen, and placed him on a chair by the door with an apple in his hand. Soon after this little Marlene came up to her mother, who was stirring a pot of boiling water over the fire, and said, "'Mother, brother is sitting by the door with an apple in his hand, and he looks so pale. And when I asked him to give me the apple, he did not answer. 
and that frightened me. Go to him again, said her mother, and if he does not answer, give him a box on the ear. So little Marlene went and said, Brother, give me that apple. But he did not say a word. Then she gave him a box on the ear, and his head rolled off. She was so terrified at this that she ran crying and screaming to her mother. Oh, she said, I have knocked off brother's head. And then she wept and wept, and nothing would stop her. What have you done? said her mother. But no one must know about it, so you must keep silence. What is done can't be undone. We will make him into puddings. And she took the little boy and cut him up, made him into puddings, and put him in the pot. But Marlene stood looking on, and wept and wept, and her tears fell into the pot, so that there really was no need of salt. Presently the father came home and sat down to his dinner. He asked, Where is my son? Mother said nothing, but gave him a large dish of black pudding, and Marlene still wept without ceasing. The father again asked, Where is my son? Oh, answered the wife, he is gone into the country to his mother's great-uncle. He is going to stay there some time. What has he gone there for? And he never even said good-bye to me. Well, he likes being there, and he told me he should be away quite six weeks. He is well looked after there. I feel very unhappy about it said the husband, in case it should not be all right, and he ought to have said good-bye to me. With this he went on with his dinner, and said, Little Marlene, why do you weep? Brother will soon be back. Then he asked his wife for more pudding, and as he ate, he threw the bones under the table. Little Marlene went upstairs, and took her best silk handkerchief out of her bottom drawer and in it she wrapped all the bones from under the table and carried them outside, and all the time she did nothing but weep. Then she laid them in the green grass under the juniper tree, and she had no sooner done so than all her sadness seemed to leave her, and she wept no more. And now the juniper tree began to move, and the branches waved backwards and forwards, first away from one another, and then together again, as it might by someone clasping their hands for joy. After this a mist came round the tree, and in the midst of it there was a burning as of fire, and out of the fire there flew a beautiful bird that rose high into the air, singing magnificently, and when it could no more be seen, the juniper tree stood there as before, and the silk handkerchief and the bones were gone. Little Marlene now felt as light-hearted and happy as if her brother were still alive, and she went back to the house and sat down cheerfully to the table and ate. The bird flew away and alighted on the house of a goldsmith, and began to sing. My mother killed her little son. My father grieved when I was gone. My sister loved me best of all. She laid my kerchief over me, and took my bones that they might lie underneath the juniper tree. Kiweet! Kiweet! What a beautiful bird am I! The goldsmith was in his workshop making a gold chain when he heard the song of the bird on his roof. He thought it so beautiful that he got up and ran out, and as he crossed the threshold he lost one of his slippers. But he ran on into the middle of the street with a slipper on one foot and a sock on the other. He still had on his apron, and still held the gold chain and the pincers in his hands, and so he stood gazing up at the bird, while the sun came shining brightly down on the street. "'Bird,' he said, "'how beautifully you sing! Sing me that song again!' "'Nay,' said the bird, "'I do not sing twice for nothing. Give that gold chain, and I will sing it you again. Here is the chain. Take it, said the goldsmith. Only sing me that again. The bird flew down and took the gold chain in his right claw, and then he alighted again in front of the goldsmith and sang, 
My mother killed her little son. My father grieved when I was gone. My sister loved me best of all. She laid her kerchief over me, and took my bones that they might lie underneath the juniper tree. Kiwit, kiwit, what a beautiful bird am I! Then he flew away, and settled on the roof of a shoemaker's house, and sang, My mother killed her little son. My father grieved when I was gone. My sister loved me best of all. She laid her kerchief over me, and took my bones, that they might lie underneath a juniper tree. Kiwit, kiwit, what a beautiful bird am I! The shoemaker heard him, and he jumped up and ran out in his shirt-sleeves, and stood looking up at the bird on the roof with his hand over his eyes, to keep himself from being blinded by the sun. Bird, he said, how beautifully you sing! Then he called through the door to his wife, Wife, come out! Here is a bird, come and look at it, and hear how beautifully it sings. Then he called his daughter and the children, then the apprentices, girls and boys, and they all ran up the street to look at the bird, and saw how splendid it was with its red and green feathers, and its neck like burnished gold, and eyes like two bright stars in its head. Bird said the shoemaker, sing me that song again. Nay, answered the bird, I do not sing twice for nothing. You must give me something. Wife, said the man, go into the garret. On the upper shelf you will see a pair of red shoes. Bring them to me. The wife went in and fetched the shoes. There, bird, said the shoemaker, now sing me that song again. The bird flew down and took the red shoes in his left claw, and then he went back to the roof and sang, My mother killed her little son, my father grieved when I was gone, my sister loved me best of all. She laid her kerchief over me, and took my bones that they might lie underneath the juniper tree. Kiwit, kiwit, what a beautiful bird am I! When he had finished, he flew away. He had the chain in his right claw, and the shoes in his left, and he flew right away to a mill, and the mill went click-clack, click-clack, click-clack. Inside the mill were twenty of the miller's men, hewing a stone, and as they went hick-clack, 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 the mill went click-clack, click-clack, click-clack. The bird settled on a lime tree in front of the mill, and sang, my mother killed her little son. Then one of the men left off. My father grieved when I was gone. Two more men left off and listened. My sister loved me best of all. Then four more left off. She laid her kerchief over me and took my bones that they might lie. Now there were only eight at work, underneath, and now only five. The juniper tree and now only one. Kiwit, kiwit, what a beautiful bird am I! Then he looked up, and the last one had left off work. Bird, he said, what a beautiful song that is, you sing. Let me hear it too. Sing it again. Nay, answered the bird, I do not sing twice for nothing. Give me that millstone, and I will sing it again. If it belonged to me alone, said the man, you should have it. Yes, yes, said the others. If you will sing again, he can have it. The bird came down, and all the twenty millers set to and lifted up the stone with a beam. Then the bird put his head through the hole and took the stone round his neck like a collar, and flew back with it to the tree, and sang, My mother killed her little son. My father grieved when I was gone. My sister loved me best of all. She laid her kerchief over me, and took my bones, that they might lie underneath the juniper tree. Kiwit, kiwit, what a beautiful bird am I! And when he had finished his song, he spread his wings, and with the chain in his right claw, the shoes in his left, and the millstone round his neck, he flew right away to his father's house. The father, the mother, and little Marlene were having their dinner. 
"'How light-hearted I feel!' said the father, "'so pleased and cheerful!' "'And I,' said the mother, "'I feel so uneasy, as if a heavy thunderstorm were coming!' But little Marlene sat and wept and wept. Then the bird came flying towards the house and settled on the roof. "'I do feel so happy,' said the father, "'and how beautifully the sun shines! I feel just as if I were going to see an old friend again.' "'Ah!' Oh, said the wife, "'and I am so full of distress and uneasiness that my teeth chatter, and I feel as if there were a fire in my veins.' and she tore open her dress, and all the while little Marlene sat in the corner and wept, and the plate on her knees was wet with her tears. The bird now flew to the juniper tree, and began singing, My mother killed her little son. The mother shut her eyes and her ears, that she might see and hear nothing, but there was a roaring sound in her ears, like that of a violent storm and in her eyes a burning and flashing like lightning. My father grieved when I was gone. Look, mother, said the man, at the beautiful bird that is singing so magnificently, and how warm and bright the sun is, and what a delicious scent of spice in the air. My sister loved me best of all. Then little Marlene laid her head down on her knees and sobbed. "'I must go outside and see the bird nearer,' said the man. "'Oh, do not go,' cried the wife. "'I feel as if the whole house were in flames.' But the man went out and looked at the bird. "'She laid her kerchief over me, and took my bones that they might lie underneath the juniper-tree. Kiwit, kiwit! What a beautiful bird am I!' With that the bird let fall the gold chain and it fell just round the man's neck, so that it fitted him exactly. He went inside and said, See, what a splendid bird that is! He has given me this beautiful gold chain, and looks so beautiful himself. But the wife was in such fear and trouble that she fell on the floor, and her cap fell from her head. Then the bird began again. "'My mother killed her little son.' "'Ah, oh, me!' cried the wife. "'If I were but a thousand feet beneath the earth, that I might not hear that song. My father grieved when I was gone.' Then the woman fell down again, as if dead. "'My sister loved me best of all.' "'Well,' said little Marlene, "'I will go out, too, and see if the bird will give me anything.' So she went out. She laid her kerchief over me, and took my bones that they might lie, and he threw down the shoes to her, underneath the juniper tree. Kiwit, kiwit, what a beautiful bird am I! And she now felt quite happy and light-hearted. She put on the shoes, and danced and jumped about in them. I was so miserable, she said, when I came out. But that has all passed away. That is indeed a splendid bird, and he has given me a pair of red shoes." The wife sprang up, with her hair standing out from her head like flames of fire. "'Then I will go out too,' she said, "'and see if it will lighten my misery, for I feel as if the world were coming to an end.' But as she crossed the threshold, crash! The bird threw the millstone down on her head, and she was crushed to death. The father and little Marlene heard the sound and ran out, but they only saw mist and flame and fire rising from the spot, and when these had passed, there stood the little brother, and he took the father and little Marlene by the hand. Then they all three rejoiced, and went inside together, and sat down to their dinners and eight. End of the Juniper Tree The Turnip From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There were two brothers who were both soldiers, the one was rich and the other poor. The poor man thought that he would try to better himself, 
So, pulling off his red coat, he became a gardener, and dug his ground well and sowed turnips. When the seed came, there was one plant bigger than all the rest, and it kept getting larger and larger, and seemed as if it would never cease growing, so that it might have been called the Prince of Turnips, for there never was such a one seen before, and never will again. At last it was so big that it filled a cart, and two oxen could hardly draw it, and the gardener knew not what in the world to do with it, nor whether it would be a blessing or a curse to him. One day he said to himself, What shall I do with it? If I sell it, it will bring no more than another, and for eating the little turnips are better than this. The best thing, perhaps, is to carry it and give it to the king as a mark of respect. Then he yoked his oxen, and drew the turnip to his court, and gave it to the king. "'What a wonderful thing!' said the king. "'I have seen many strange things, but such a monster as this I never saw. Where did you get the seed? Or is it only your good luck? If so, you are a true child of fortune.' "'Ah, no,' answered the gardener, "'I am no child of fortune. I am a poor soldier who never could get enough to live upon, so I laid aside my red coat and set to work tilling the ground. I have a brother who is rich, and your majesty knows him well, and all the world knows him, but because I am poor, everybody forgets me. The king then took pity on him, and said, You shall be poor no longer, I will give you so much that you shall be even richer than your brother. Then he gave him gold and lands and flocks, and made him so rich that his brother's fortune could not at all be compared with his. When the brother heard of all this, and how a turnip had made the gardener so rich, he envied him sorely, and bethought himself how he could contrive to get the same good fortune for himself. However, he determined to manage more cleverly than his brother and got together a rich present of gold and fine horses for the king, and thought he must have a much larger gift in return, for if his brother had received so much for only a turnip, what must his present be worth? The king took the gift very graciously, and said he knew not what to give in return more valuable and wonderful than the great turnip. So the soldier was forced to put it into a cart and drag it home with him. When he reached home, he knew not upon whom to vent his rage and spite, and at length wicked thoughts came into his head, and he resolved to kill his brother. So he hired some villains to murder him, and having shown them where to lie in ambush, he went to his brother and said, Dear brother, I have found a hidden treasure. Let us go and dig it up and share it between us. The other had no suspicions of his roguery. So they went out together, and as they were travelling along, the murderers rushed out upon him, bound him, and were going to hang him on a tree. But whilst they were getting all ready, they heard the trampling of a horse at a distance, which so frightened them that they pushed their prisoner neck and shoulders together into a sack, and swung him by a cord to the tree, where they left him dangling and ran away. Meantime he worked and worked away till he made a hole large enough to put out his head. When the horseman came up, he proved to be a student, a merry fellow, who was journeying along on his nag, and singing as he went. As soon as the man in the sack saw him passing under the tree, he cried out, "'Good morning! Good morning to thee, my friend!' The student looked about everywhere, and seeing no one, and not knowing where the voice came from, cried out, "'Who calls me?' Then the man in the tree answered, Lift up thine eyes, for behold, here I sit in the sack of wisdom. Here have I, in a short time, learned great and wondrous things. Compared to this seat, all the learning of the schools is as empty air. A little longer, and I shall know all that man can know, and shall come forth wiser than the wisest of mankind. Here I discern the signs and motions of the heavens and the stars, the laws that control the winds, the number of the sands on the seashore, the healing of the sick, the virtues of all simples, of birds, and of precious stones. 
Wert thou but once here, my friend, thou wouldst feel and own the power of knowledge. The student listened to all this, and wondered much. At last he said, Blessed be the day and hour when I found you. Cannot you contrive to let me into the sack for a little while? Then the other answered, as if very unwillingly, A little space I may allow thee to sit here, if thou wilt reward me well and entreat me kindly. But thou must tarry yet an hour below, till I have learnt some little matters that are yet unknown to me. So the student sat himself down and waited a while, but the time hung heavy upon him, and he begged earnestly that he might ascend forthwith, for his thirst for knowledge was great. Then the other pretended to give way, and said, Thou must let the sack of wisdom descend by untying yonder cord, and then thou shalt enter. So the student led him down, opened the sack, and set him free. Now then, cried he, let me ascend quickly. As he began to put himself into the sack, heels first. Wait a while, said the gardener, that is not the way. Then he pushed him in head first, tied up the sack, and soon swung up the searcher after wisdom dangling in the air. How is it with thee, friend? said he. Dost thou not feel that wisdom comes unto thee? Rest there in peace till thou art a wiser man than thou wert. So saying, he trotted off on the student's nag, and left the poor fellow to gather wisdom till somebody should come and let him down. End of the Turnip Clever Hans From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm The mother of Hans said, Whither away, Hans? Hans answered, To Gretel. Behave well, Hans. Oh, I'll behave well. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans comes to Gretel. Good-day, Gretel. Good-day, Hans. What do you bring that is good? I bring nothing. I want to have something given me. Gretel presents Hans with a needle. Hans says, Goodbye, Gretel. Goodbye, Hans. Hans takes the needle, sticks it into a hay cart, and follows the cart home. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? With Gretel. What did you take her? I took nothing had something given me. What did Gretel give you? Gave me a needle. Where is the needle, Hans? Stuck in the hay-cart. That was ill done, Hans. You should have stuck the needle in your sleeve. Never mind. I'll do better next time. Whither away, Hans? To Gretel, mother. Behave well, Hans. I'll behave well. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans comes to Gretel. Good day, Gretel. Good day, Hans. What do you bring that is good? I bring nothing. I want to have something given to me. Gretel presents Hans with a knife. Good-bye, Gretel. Good-bye, Hans. Hans takes the knife, sticks it in his sleeve, and goes home. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? With Gretel. With Gretel? What did you take her? I took her nothing. She gave me something. What did Gretel give you? Gave me a knife. Where is the knife, Hans? Stuck in my sleeve. That's ill done, Hans. You should have put the knife in your pocket. Never mind. We'll do better next time. Whither away, Hans? To Gretel, mother. Behave well, Hans. Oh, I'll behave well. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans comes to Gretel. Good-day, Gretel. Good-day, Hans. What good thing do you bring? I bring nothing. I want something given me. Gretel presents Hans with a young goat. Good-bye, Gretel. Good-bye, Hans. Hans takes the goat, ties its legs, and puts it in his pocket. When he gets home, it is suffocated. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? With Gretel. What did you take her? I took nothing. 
she gave me something. What did Gretel give you? She gave me a goat. Where is the goat, Hans? I put it in my pocket. That was ill done, Hans. You should have put a rope around the goat's neck. Never mind. We'll do better next time. Whither away, Hans? To Gretel, mother. Behave well, Hans. Oh, I'll behave well. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans comes to Gretel. Good day, Gretel. Good day, Hans. What good thing do you bring? I bring nothing. I want something given me. Gretel presents Hans with a piece of bacon. Good-bye, Gretel. Good-bye, Hans. Hans takes the bacon, ties it to a rope, and drags it away behind him. The dogs come and devour the bacon. When he gets home he has a rope in his hand, and there is no longer anything hanging on to it. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? With Gretel. What did you take her? I took her nothing. She gave me something. What did Gretel give you? Gave me a bit of bacon. Where is the bacon, Hans? I tied it to a rope, brought it home. Dogs took it. That was ill done, Hans. You should have carried the bacon on your head. Never mind. We'll do better next time. Whither away, Hans? To Gretel, mother. Behave well, Hans. I'll behave well. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans comes to Gretel. Good day, Gretel. Good day, Hans. What good thing do you bring? I bring nothing, but would have something given. Gretel presents Hans with a calf. Good-bye, Gretel. Good-bye, Hans. Hans takes the calf, puts it on his head, and the calf kicks his face. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? With Gretel. What did you take her? I took nothing, but had something given me. What did Gretel give you? A calf. Where have you the calf, Hans? I set it on my head, and it kicked my face. That was ill done, Hans. You should have led the calf and put it in the stall. Never mind. We'll do better next time. Whither away, Hans? To Gretel, mother. Behave well, Hans. I'll behave well. Good-bye, mother. Good-bye, Hans. Hans comes to Gretel. Good day, Gretel. Good day, Hans. What good thing do you bring? I bring nothing, but would have something given. Gretel says to Hans, I will go with you. Hans takes Gretel, ties her to a rope, leads her to the rack, and binds her fast. Then Hans goes to his mother. Good evening, mother. Good evening, Hans. Where have you been? With Gretel. What did you take her? I took her nothing. What did Gretel give you? She gave me nothing. She came with me. Where have you left Gretel? I led her by the rope, tied her to the rack, and scattered some grass for her. That was ill done, Hans. You should have cast friendly eyes on her. Never mind. We'll do better. Hans went into the stable, cut out all the calves' and sheep's eyes, and threw them in Gretel's face. Then Gretel became angry, tore herself loose, and ran away, and was no longer the bride of Hans. End of Clever Hans